It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therat is here with the latest on the Activision acquisition, the biggest acquisition in Microsoft's history, and it could be on the line. Plus, we'll talk about new features in Windows 11, a Discord-like feature that comes to free teams, and then Paul will run down his top podcasts, audiobooks, and songs of the year. It's going to be a great Windows Weekly next. <laughs> Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therat, episode 806, recorded Wednesday, December 7th, 2022. Clippy in prison. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Lenovo, orchestrated by the experts at CDW to help transform your organization with Lenovo ThinkPads, equipped with the Intel Evo platform for effortless connectivity and collaboration from anywhere. Learn more at cdw.com slash Lenovo client. And by Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? Cancel those unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com slash windows. Seriously, it could save you hundreds a year. And by Melissa. Over 10,000 clients worldwide in industries like retail, education, healthcare, insurance, finance, and government rely on Melissa for full-spectrum data quality and ID verification software. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Microsoft, where it is snowing on Clippy. Hello, mm -hmm. Paul Therat, therat.com, leanpump.com. Hello. Leo. Hello. I, wore, I, I, I didn't get the memo that we were going to hold off until December no, 21st, so... I try to put it off as long as I can. I This is a cozy little sweater. I bet. It's got, uh, I actually got it because I thought Chris Capicello would have it. Now I know right. he's not coming on the show. Because mm. every year he would come on and talk about the ugly sweater from Microsoft. And I always find out too late. So I order it the minute, the day of. It's got right. a happy holidays with a clippy and an OK mm. button that's right over my left breast. So girls, stay away. Don't don't be tempted there. And um, they're not. Trust me, they're not. <laughs> they're, not. They're, they're not. They're not. They're not. There's no temptation. Um, right. And then little, I don't know what is going on on this sleeve. Little things. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's. I like it. It's a nice. It's good colors. It's got green and Microsoft mm. blue and. I do like the colors. Yeah. Yeah. It's cozy and warm. Not a fan of sweaters, personally. But, You're not. Uh, no, You're not a warm. sweater guy. You live in the uh, in, in cold country. I need something for my feet, <laughs> not for my my you upper know, body. They've invented something that is basically sweaters for your feet. They call them socks. Mm. Mm. I see. I'll look into that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I saw on your Insta pictures mm -hmm. of you and Mary Jo Foley. Yep. yucking it up. You took a train to Newark. Yeah, a friend of ours visited from the UK with his wife. They're, in fact, they were celebrating their 10th anniversary. Oh, that's nice. And so we said, yeah, we'll come on into town, you know. Nice. And Mary Jo yeah. happened to be, does she know uh, Mr. Was it Chris? Oh, yeah, yeah. Lovett? It was, yeah, we all, yeah. no, no uh, <laughs> Gary uh, Pretty is his Gary name. Pretty. And, I uh, confuse him yep. and Chris Lovett. Gary Pretty. Yep. And uh, so she knows Gary. Good old Gary. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And where do you guys go now that there's no rattle and hum? Well, it's someplace different every time. Oh, actually, there's no there's yeah. no uh, local that you go on a regular basis. That's I bad. sort of figured. I thought you know, given where she is and given what those guys were doing, that we would meet right at uh, you know Madison Square Garden, that area, Midtown. Yeah, Midtown. I guess call it. Yeah. And this was way down south. By the uh, way, the Yale Club is very near Madison Square yes. Garden. If you ever yes, it is. If you ever need yes, to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, after after that humiliation some years ago, I uh, I dropped my membership. Oh, did you really? I, yeah, because oh. I stayed there once and you stayed there once, and I was paying it for was, years. <laughs> it was beautiful. I mean, it was a beautiful place. I thought, well, it'd be but, good to have a little pied de terre in the city, but I never oh, yes. go to the city. So right, right, right. And it's not really much cheaper than a hotel. And a hotel you can get 
easily whenever you want it and not pay for well, it year round. Interestingly, on this particular trip, you know, Gary contacted us back in October. I'm like, yep, we'll come into town. Don't worry about it. Nice. Just let me know the dates. And then uh, we started looking at the uh, hotel rates. And for some reason, oh, no, not for some reason. I think they were lighting the Christmas tree. Oh, or yeah, something I guess. And, yeah, there's uh, certain. So uh, these surge, hotels, which, surge pricing, they call it. Yeah, the last time we went, this is embarrassing, but we haven't been to New York City since April 2021. That yeah. was the first time we had gone since the pandemic. And we paid $99 to stay at a Hilton. Wow. And and this on this weekend, all the hotels were 600 bucks a night. Yeah. So we had to stay. Yeah. We ended up staying out by the um, Newark Liberty Airport. And we just took oh, a, Jesus, that's Uber. a nightmare. And we stayed in Newark and Ubered in. Talk about bridge and yeah. tunnel. Holy cow. Yeah, but actually the Uber was it was like a Cadillac Escalade. It was oh, nice. It was actually it's, really nice. It's, yeah. Newark to Manhattan is how much? Actually, it wasn't as expensive as I thought it was going to be because all of our non-Mexico Uber trips are like incredibly expensive. Yeah. When we were in Seattle, I think from the airport to the hotel was 75 bucks. Yeah. But this was 36? Oh, that's not bad. Like that. yeah. It really is better than uh, paying a lot of money for a hotel. Nice. Well, I just, we can't, I mean, I can't. Spencer, I just couldn't do it. There's no way, like 600 bucks. It just hurt. It hurt you. It hurt your, yeah. it hurt your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. I know the feeling. It was, it was fine. It was fine. And how is Mary Jo? Is she doing good? Mary Jo's doing great. Yep. Her, uh, like niece job? and I guess we'll call him her, his nephew, her nephew in law. Is that the, I don't know. We're there as well. Um, and, uh, yeah. So we went to a couple of places. We had dinner and drinks at that first place that was down toward Chinatown. And then we, we did end up back, uh, in Midtown. And I, I got to see, the new part of Penn Station, oh. um, which is gorgeous, like really, really nice. Huh. Yeah, nice. It was good. Um, good. And Mary Jo is uh, enjoying her new gig as the at Directions on Microsoft dot com editor in chief. Yeah, she said <laughs> she's still in her kind of you know I'm figuring it out yeah. phase or whatever, yeah. and um, she didn't make any noises about like please take me back please please please. <laughs> no, no. Um, she's I, I I made it clear to her she's always welcome back. Um, yeah, we'll get her on soon. Th we'll get her on fine. I think she, doing. I think she's, I, I think she wants to work less. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think she's enjoying it, right? her freedom. Yeah, yeah, good for her. Sure. Okay, well, there you go. There's the Mary Jo update. Mm -hmm. This week in Mary Jo. <sighs> now it's time to talk about the real story of the week, the month, right. the year. Um, Activision and Microsoft sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Yeah. <laughs> so there's kind of three things going on here. Um as everyone, I hope, knows, or, uh, very early this year, I think in February, Microsoft announced it plans to buy Activision Blizzard for almost seventy billion dollars, sixty-nine billion. That's a lot. That's more than Twitter. That's a lot. That's a lot of, of billions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, of course, it has to go through the regulatory process. Microsoft was very open up front. They said, "Look, this is going to take a while. We don't expect to close this until the end of our next now current fiscal year, which ends at the end of June in twenty twenty-three." Um, and they knew they were going to. There would be feedback from the EU, the UK, South Korea, China, the United States, other places, whatever. Um, I've always kind of said uh, that this is something that should sail through with the right compromises and that Microsoft would make the right compromises to make it happen. Um, what has happened since then is that one major competitor has emerged and only one <laughs> to complain about this. And that everyone knows this is Sony, right? And Sony's. Yeah. Yeah, because they have the really PlayStation. They're afraid they're going to lose the, the great big Activision yes. titles, chiefly Call of Duty. Yes. And the, a couple of things are interesting about that. Um, I, we all focus on Call of Duty, I think mostly because uh, Sony won't stop talking about it. But Microsoft keeps saying, yeah, 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 Call of Duty. We would never take that off PlayStation. That doesn't make any sense. We're doing this for the mobile play, you know. And in recent weeks, you know, Phil uh, Spencer, I was calling Phil Spector this time. <laughs> anyway, Phil Spencer, <laughs> you know, kind of a music thing going on lately. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Phil Spector has ruined more things than Phil, what's his name? Phil Schiller has. Anyway, um, <laughs> Phil Spencer, the head of Xbox, uh, has come out publicly many, many times and said, look, we're never going to do this. It doesn't make any sense. Don't worry about it, you know. Um, and they've offered uh, supposedly different deals to Sony, um, you know, whatever. So, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, 
uh, published an editorial in the Wall Street Journal this past week talking about the acquisition and the complaints they've heard and what they will do. There wasn't too much new to it. In fact, I was a little surprised how short it was. He's written very long posts in some cases. I thought I thought this guy was just going to really lay it out and say, look, bing, 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 economic advantage, blah, 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 whatever. But really, the, his editorial was about two different topics. One was Sony and the other was mobile. And on the mobile front, he actually didn't have a lot to say beyond saying, look, in the video game world, we are, he didn't say distant number three, but we have been a, a number, th we've been in the third place basically forever. And we are in third place now. <laughs> we don't ever expect to not be in third place. We're just not a dominant force in consoles. However, the way the gaming industry is going is most of the action now is taking place on mobile. In fact, by the way, even uh, Activision Blizzard is seen as not just because they have a lot of mobile games, but because one of their most lucrative franchises, Call of Duty, actually makes more money on mobile than it does on PC and console, which is crazy. It's kind of a brand new game. It's not even, not but it's not even the same game on mobile, right? It's like, it's not, well, it's they had the a zombies levels. thing. It's, oh, really? It's multiplayer. Yeah, you could play multiplayer. It's, it's actually pretty damn good, I have oh. to say. You wouldn't play um, it on a phone. I wouldn't because I wouldn't be able to see it, but I, I played it on an iPad with an Xbox it's controller. Probably okay I'm going to tell iPad. you, it's, yeah. it's yeah. not not horrible. Yeah. Um, but that's whatever. That's, you know, neither here nor there. It's popular. But, yeah. Yeah. The complaint that he had, which is the complaint that all developers have basically and what Microsoft has said in the past, is that we have these two gatekeepers in mobile, Apple and Google, and both of them uh, charge inordinate fees and impose crazy restrictions on developers when it comes to dodging in-app payments, which is where Apple makes all their money. When you look at Apple's services business, which is their second biggest business, um, most of that comes from the App Store, of course. They charge 30%, which 30% is as arbitrary a number as 10,000 steps, 1,000 hours to become an expert, eight glasses of water a day, all these things that like we have in our heads that are just the way they are. None of those mean anything. They're all nonsense. Well, but they were just but Microsoft up. charges 30%. No, so does do Sony, not. don't they? Oh, on Xbox, yes. Yes. But we can, exp but we can explain that. Because but they did it first. <laughs> so Apple, I think, yes. was following along with what they uh, thought was industry stand, pra standard practice. Mm, I don't I doubt that. But I don't I don't I don't. OK, let's let's just say that's what it is. Who cares? That's fine. The, the problem when when you have a, a market that is some size, you can do whatever you want. Right. But at some point you become a monopoly or in this case, a duopoly and you have to follow slightly different rules. The, the things that were OK for you as a s scrappy startup are no longer OK because now you're a dominant market power. Apple keeps talking about the billions of users they have. They're, they're, they're one of only two mobile um, platforms. There is a, there's a weird, this is all, mostly on Google's part, I will say, but there is a weird, uh, almost Japanese style of non-competition between these two companies where their mobile app stores have exactly the same terms everywhere. Um, that has to be on purpose. That's on Google's part, but- um, Wait a minute. But so does Sony and so does Xbox. Yes, Sony, okay, let's... So let, is Microsoft here's the difference. following Apple or Apple following Microsoft or Google following... I don't know that... that I don't Everybody know that agrees is, it's 30%. I, that's the standard. Nobody, actually, I don't know that who... Okay, so, for, so two things. Um, we're only talking about four or five companies here. <laughs> so Sony, but Apple... But you can't say I'm it's sorry. Apple, Google. It is, it is a I, no, broad range yes, of stores. No, it's not. <laughs> Hold on. I can say that because Microsoft, Sony have markets that are number in the tens of millions. Apple and Google have markets that number in the billions. Those are order of magnitude differences. Um, Apple and How Google. How about Steam? Would you include Steam in that list? Steam also yeah, sure. charges 30%. About also a tiny market compared to Apple and Google. They're, they have to play by, they play by different rules. That is li literally the law. They, they, are, they are not beholden to the same set of rules. If you don't have a monopoly, you but can they do don't whatever have a you monopoly. want with it. But that's, yes, they do. Of course they do. Apple, Apple has a monopoly a, among people who use iPhones, but iPhones is isn't even more than half the market. But it is 1.5 billion people. Yeah. Just by itself. In, an eight, in a the, world with 8 billion people. But a, in a world of 3 or 4 million phone users. That, that is a, that's a duopoly is what it is. There is no competition in this market. And when the only two people who control this market, companies control this market, set prices arbitrarily with no relation to the cost of doing business and are able to prevent companies like Microsoft 
from coming out with an app that will let them run cloud gaming, streaming games, because what Apple wants to do is charge a 30% fee on every game that anyone plays through that platform, whether it impacts their infrastructure or not, and use their in-app payments, whether because there are no other choices, basically, unless you Spotify, that's starting to change. Only on Google. <laughs> no, that's, um, I don't remember. Is that Apple or Google? I think it's only on Google. Sorry, it's only on Google. And these are, that's what makes these things different. Apple sells in some years more phones in one quarter than Sony or Microsoft sell consoles in one entire generation over seven to yeah, 10 years. No, that's right. Yep. That's, this is a completely different kind of market. Um, it, it, it's, and the other thing is I, I, I haven't published this yet, but I've been writing this thing about, um, what Microsoft used to call the next wave. And when you look at personal computing, I think it's fair to say we've only had two major eras of personal computing. There was the PC, the personal computer era, which was mostly windows, but also Mac. And I know what Linux, and in the early days we had, you know, Commodore, Atari, TI, whatever. And then we've had the mobile phone era, which started with the iPhone, the modern smartphone era, right? Um, these things are, the, the thing is when, when Microsoft controlled the world, if you go back in time, 20 years, uh, 25 years, whatever, we were talking about hundreds of millions of computers and Microsoft to a lot of people was the most evil company on earth. But one of the things they didn't do was prevent developers from releasing apps on their platform, right? Unless they follow some crazy arbitrary rules. Uh, Apple and Google control markets that are in the billions of users this is a much bigger thing than the first era of personal computing. Um, they are the gatekeepers. And this is, you know, this is starting, not starting, this has been a problem for a long time. So the argument from Microsoft, I'll just use the Microsoft example, because they, you know, they've been very public about this. They wanted to put Xbox cloud gaming on Android and iOS. Google said yes, and Apple said no. And Microsoft said, why? And they said, well, you have all these games in here. We need to make money on every single one of those things. And they're like, this has nothing to yeah, do with that's you. that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But this, yeah, this, so this is the argument. So uh, Mr. Smith, sorry to get back to the, his public argument in the Wall Street Journal. He basically laid out two points. He said, look, this acquisition will be good for the industry. And it will help solve two problems. One of the problems is mobile. And one of the problems is Sony, <laughs> so which is kind of an interesting way to put it. But uh, he in no way explained how them acquiring Activision Blizzard would solve the mobile problem. All he basically was arguing was that once they have this stuff, they'll have more content and I guess they'll have more leverage or something. I, Apple is never going to <laughs> make any changes for them. Apple and to a lesser extent, Google <clears throat> will need to be prodded by antitrust to make changes. And I think the reason they're digging their heels in so egregiously, especially Apple, which is insane in some ways, is because they know that by doing this now, they'll get the best deal they can get in the future. In other words, we don't know what the number is, but let's say Apple could run their uh, App Store infrastructure with a 5% fee and still be wildly pop, yeah, or, um, profitable. They don't want 5%. They want 15% or you know, they want something in the middle. And they they're, they're, that's probably where this is headed. This is kind of a secondary issue. How would, topic, who but. would figure that out, though? And how would they figure that out? Like, what well, is Apple's it, cost of business? Yeah. Right? Internally, of they know what they, they know. What, they they know. know what it is. Of course they, they know. know what it is. Yeah. So, you know, how we, every time there are uh, quarterly results uh, from Microsoft primarily, right? But I also cover other companies. We write about this and we look at the data that they provide. And you can see the giant holes in the data that they don't Yeah, provide. yeah. They don't so, want to give you the deets. Yeah. One of the things that Apple used to do, which I really liked, I thought it was very transparent, was they would actually provide literal numbers of units sold of their top platform. So we sold this many iPhones, we sold this many iPads, this many Macs, whatever those things were. Over time, because eventually the hyper growth has to stop, um, they stopped doing that. And, you know, legally they can, but it becomes less transparent. You know, one of the, one of the bits of data they've never shared and won't share because this I think, you know, many people think, including a guy that used to run that business for Apple, who's actually spoken, you know, publicly about it since he left the company, is that this thing is stupid successful because these fees have nothing to do with how much it costs them to run the business. But like I said, it's kind of a secondary issue because the real issue here is it doesn't matter how much it costs to run that business. They're, they want to charge developers for things that have nothing to do with the infrastructure that they are paying for. Um, and I... I you know, uh, Microsoft would like there to be a, 
Microsoft would like to do with Epic would like to do like I'm sure many others would like to do, which is not just have a choice of in-app payment systems that where they could, you know, have competition, get the lowest possible fees, but also have it be open like it is on PC and Mac where you can have multiple stores or just an open system on the web. And we all know the arguments against it. <laughs> you know, we all know the arguments for it. But I mean, you and I have talked about this a lot. I think ultimately... Um, open wins the day. And Apple is the exact opposite of open, especially when it comes to this part of their business. Okay. I'm going to channel Alex Lindsay here because he's the yeah. uh, stalwart defender of this whole thing. Okay, good. And, 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 has, and has, you know, a little bit more uh, uh, expertise in this arena because he's had apps mm -hmm. on the App Store. He's, he's submitted apps. Mm -hmm. He's put apps up there. And he yep. says, as a developer of apps, uh, the convenience of the App Store makes it well worth it. Remember, Ingram used to charge a lot more to distribute a box of Microsoft Office. They'd take half or more. That's not that, that's not what we're comparing <clears throat> and, it to. We have well, the web but, now. Okay, so we have the web now, but you still have to create a website. You'd have to pay for bandwidth. Uh, okay, and there's so and there's little, and there's the discoverability is, of the App Store, uh, which is a value. There's no such people. thing as discoverability in the App Store. There's 80 billion apps in there. There's no discoverability. Well, you can, the chance that you release an app and no one ever sees it is 99%. I just say this, but, you, like but users, like, users on the iPhone, uh, are gonna they're gonna search the App Store if they hear yeah, about something. and it, it, that would be fantastic if that was one option. <laughs> Actually, I gotta tell you, I almost don't care if option. there is. No, no, if it was one of some options, like, like there are words. other app stores. Yeah, I think Apple makes a pretty apps. credible case that other app stores are not a, gr a desirable thing. I mean, they're on Android. Look, it doesn't I, change the okay, it doesn't change sorry, the we're equation. We're arguing something that has nothing to do with this topic. So let me just say this. Alex, as, an, as a developer, as an individual, and the fact that Apple has services that are important to him makes sense. He is part He's, of what is 99% 90, of the developers on there, but also part of the, from a revenue perspective, of the 1%. So the companies that want change are companies that want to, and by the way, the thing, one thing that would benefit him would be a choice of payment systems where they could compete on price and he could pay a lower fee to get the exact same service in the exact same store. Well, that do, would be to do that one. fairly. You'd have to have a separate store because Apple's paying the bandwidth and 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 storing the app. So and signing the app and all this security stuff. So if you're going to do that fairly, you have to okay. open other app well, stores, not just say Google's, other payment systems. Google is test marketing this system right now with Spotify and several other companies. And well, that's so th there there is an argument for companies like Netflix and Spotify that there's really no reason okay. for I'm Apple sorry. to take thirty percent, and they'd only take fifteen percent, by the way. <laughs> Hold not on. Thirty. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, that was. That's actually not my second point. My second point was, <laughs> he he is he is not representative. <laughs> so uh, we're not talking about Alex Lindsay, personal developer. I've made apps. Look, I put something in the store. I'm talking about Microsoft, the biggest software company on earth. Yeah. I'm talking about Epic Games. I'm talking about big software companies. They don't need these things that Apple provides, and it's not worth 30% of the money that you make. That's crazy. Well, that's true. They know how much this thing costs. That's true. Although they Apple, know how much it costs. Apple does set, you know, give those people a break. It's 15%. I okay, mean, but it's not. It's listen, just, it should be zero? Is that what you're saying? Mass, no, no. I'm not, should I'm Microsoft actually, be told how much they can take in the Xbox store and Sony and... And Steam be told how much they should take. Yeah, I actually, know there's smaller they markets, but but okay. should some regulator yes. come in and say, yes. "No, you don't get thirty percent. Um, uh, no, you get 15. Leo, <laughs> Leo, Leo, listen. If you owned a car and you could only buy gas at one gas station on Earth, you'd have to pay the price that they asked because that was the only gas station. But if there were different gas stations and they all competed, you you would the prices would naturally be lower. There's just no choice. the The point is they are keeping prices artificially high, which is price fixing. And preventing companies like Microsoft with cloud gaming from conducting business and interacting with their own yeah, customers. No, I think the argument like for Microsoft makes sense. But there are vast number of small developers who use yeah. the App Store and would have no other good way no, no, of doing this. No one's saying take away the App Store. <laughs> and, and they're very happy. No, they're very happy to pay 30% okay. because of the benefit yeah. they get. It's the Microsoft, Spotify's, and Netflix of the world that don't want to pay 30%. Let's be clear. And it's Spotify that's given the, no, no. this App Store no, 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 a hard time no. in EU. It's all coming from no, that's, Spotify. That's not I don't have any sympathy every, for that. That's, not, that's just some no, big no, no, company saying, if, I don't want you no, to take it. No, <laughs> but it's not correct. If every developer on earth, Alex Lindsay all the way up to Microsoft, would still benefit 
from lower fees if those fees were still fair to Apple. The point of the 30% complaint is that that is inordinately expensive. It has nothing to do with the reality of running that store. It is probably, it is anywhere from three to 10 times too expensive. Um, I don't know how we know that. Because there are other companies that do this kind of thing. And by the way, Apple benefits from scale that they get a better deal from MasterCard and Visa and American Express because of the volume of traffic that they do. They they are, as a bigger company, but actually their costs are lower as a percentage, you know, uh, higher, I guess, overall. But because there, there's so much interest in that store, there, it's a virtuous cycle. And look, the only way we can truly know it is for court, court cases like what's happening with Epic and maybe with other companies in the future where this stuff will have to come out. And I, it say, feels well, like the, pos your, the position, though, is we're big, rich companies, and we don't want Apple to make as much money. No, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't. Not I don't. I don't no, think no, no, that no, that's no. fair. Okay. And if okay. Apple, right. if Microsoft were in the same position <laughs> with a minority, right. with a majority uh, uh, Leo, share yeah. of the market, and they locked it in, wouldn't this? this, is, this wouldn't this they be not, doing this, the same defense? This is not their complaint at all. I just brought this up as part of the big broader complaint well, about the App Store. Br well, Brad Smith Microsoft's, was complaining. Brad, no, Brad Smith was complaining that as gatekeepers to mobile, they're actually preventing them from getting their games out to mobile users. Right. They've because had to bypass App the App Store. Issue. Yeah. Yes. It has not, I, I just mentioned that because this is part of a bigger story. He didn't bring this up. So I don't, I, I we can, like I said, we can debate that, but that's not the that's not the his issue was that they, they wouldn't let microsoft do a do a store is that what he was i didn't it's read it's not read a the store <laughs> it's not a store they wouldn't let them release an app called xbox cloud gaming that would allow people to access the library of games that are available on microsoft's data centers by the way not apples and stream them to these devices that in no way would impact apple's infrastructure <laughs> Because what Apple wants to do is take a 30 or 15, whatever the number is, percent cut of each one of those games, of whatever value they think they might have. They don't want, well, so Microsoft says, well, hold on a second. Yeah, Netflix is on there doing this with movies. YouTube music is on there doing this with music. How are games different? Do you know how games are different? Apple would never say this because games make up... I don't, I don't remember numbers off the top. I had 80 something percent, I believe is the figure of the profits and revenues that app stores generate. That's when, you know, I talked about like the 1%, 99%. When you come at like for the content type, most of the stuff in the app store is, I don't know what the breakdown is, but most of the profits and revenues are games. If it wasn't for games, the app store would, well, it wouldn't be a non-event, but it'd be a much smaller entity. So they look at this thing differently because it's games, because games are so lucrative for Apple, not the games they make, although they have their own service, but games that others sell on their service because they get that cut. So what what do you think Microsoft would like? I mean, if they could make the rules, would like Apple to do just say, uh, hey, go well, ahead, put your game, your game store in here. Your no, no, it's X not game store. I know, but it's, it's well, okay, no, X Cloud so, in there, look, there and there, we won't charge two, you anything, even though you're charging no. money for the use of it. Let's say, let's say, what Apple would like to do is this: uh, you have an Xbox, well, an uh, Xbox Cloud Gaming app. It's fine. If you subscribe to the service through this app, which is Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, we get a fifteen percent cut every month of the fifteen dollars a month that you are charging your own customer. Right. So Microsoft's losing that amount because right. someone decided to sign up to the app. Okay, right. fine. Microsoft's response to that could be like, well, we're not going to allow signups in the app, which Apple would say, well, that's fine, but you can't even tell people you can sign up because that's one of the things that, you know, Apple does. They're terrible, right. but whatever. Right. So I think they would like to change that. Uh, that's one thing, right? Now, as far as the actual amount of the fee, I, you know, that's, again, that's a, that's a, I don't know. And I don't think anyone really knows for sure, but there it's somewhere between 3% and 30% is the right number. And based on the way credit card companies and others with financial infrastructures work, it's a lot closer to 3% than it is to 30. But let's, whatever, let's split the difference. Say it's, what is that difference? 20 says, you know, what a 15, 18%, whatever. Whatever it is. It doesn't, I don't even care. That's not really the point. I just brought that up because that's a point with the App Store. Um, but the other issue is, but Microsoft has this thing. There are examples of these things, but they're different types of media. App, Apple is not charging, um, YouTube music or Spotify 
some 30 or 15 percent per song streamed because it has this value blah blah they don't do that with those things they only want to do it with games it it's not a store you don't buy things in it there's no nothing's getting transacted the apple's total cost for their customer using this app is that they downloaded it from their server which I, i'm not i'm not saying it doesn't cost anything but Whatever they download. Well, they the have app. credit That's card fees, did. and they have. I mean, they have four percent credit card fees or something like that, right? Okay. Um, and then they have server. They have to provide server space. Okay. And, and, and <laughs> That's bandwidth. fine. What would it would it be eight percent, ten percent? That would be fair. And I just don't know who would figure that out. I mean, what is what are they charging? Uh, if you if you have Spotify, fifteen, and you pay it, no, you pay for it yourself. You went to the web and you downloaded the app from Apple. What is spot? What is Apple getting for that for that app? Nothing. They're getting zero. So for some reason, it's okay with Spotify, which, by the way, what's their number? 500 million people use or some crazy thing? No, I think Apple Apple's gets 15% from Spotify on, they can't on subscriptions. Get, uh, there's no, the, no, I'm not talking about subscriptions. Oh, I'm if you just have you the put, app and you pay on Spotify. Put an so, app, yeah, yeah, yeah. They get zero. Yeah. So that app costs Apple more than Microsoft will ever cost them because the Xbox cloud streaming app will only be used at most by single-digit maybe double-digit millions of people. That's it forever. Right. It's never going to cost them a cent. But they look at it, and they think, we sh we can squeeze money out of this thing. And Microsoft's like, we don't charge per game. It doesn't make sense. Like, you know, what Microsoft, um, what Apple wanted Microsoft to do was put a separate app into the store for every game that they offered yeah, the game pass. that was crazy. <laughs> and it's like, guys, nobody was going to do that. And Epic right, so said the same problem, but, but I have to point out, Epic brought suit and lost over all this. Uh, that's still in court, <laughs> so we'll, well see. they've appealed, but they have lost, yeah. and there's very mm. little likelihood of the It'll, appeal succeeding. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, but uh, uh, Epic did what they did. I mean, I, I think Epic's uh, strategy is kind of interesting, but um, but part of the problem that with the Epic one, and I think you'd have the same problem with with Microsoft, is people felt like it was just one giant battling another like this isn't this is who's gonna you know who i really that? i take i take such huge exception to that because and I, I i also take huge exception to someone like alex Lindsay saying i'm happy to pay these fees that is this so well again like, just you used to pay 50 percent to pig. ingram uh it's it's better no one than it used, used to, to be no that's not that's no one paid there no one named alex Lindsay paid 50 percent to ingram <laughs> this is a new type of a thing this is a digital service you could put this on the web if you made your app for any other platform and distribute yourself and you can see what those costs are and they're so minimal if i uh if i sell a game for the xbox and microsoft takes 30 percent, that's fair Look, I, <laughs> no, it's a different market. Yeah, no, I understand it's a different actually, market, but Microsoft has no cost associated with that game, and they're taking 30%. No, no, that's not true. Actually, that is absolutely not true because the big difference between the console market and I'll just say the iPhone, just to keep it simple, is that when Mike, uh, Apple sells an iPhone, which they sell, like I said, tens of millions every quarter, they earn an incredible 35 to 40 percent profit on every single one of those it's the highest margin in hardware in the history of the earth that's what they do they make money on the hardware when apple when microsoft sells a console we just talked about this they make money on the games yeah they lose they, they literally lose hundreds yeah. of dollars and the way they make it back is by on per they, the hope is but that's their per, choice that's no, their it's, business it's, decision why should absolute, apple <laughs> because no, hold on a second. Apple is trying to have it both. They're double ways. dipping. You're saying, yeah, yeah. They absolutely are, yeah. and we could whatever. That's a moral thing. We could kind of, you know, oh, I don't like that. That's not. I'm not saying that. I, whatever they should do, whatever they can do. My point is, once you have a billion, a billion five, two billion users, the rules change. I guess. I mean, it feels like a, no, a little unfair. Do. Like, oh, you're successful, <laughs> so now we're going to take that's what, some <laughs> something away from you. They're not. A, they're so, not a monopoly. I mean. I disagree with that. That's obviously. the real, That I think that's the nut of it. Uh, and, you know, Apple's defense, which I, is kind of dopey, is, well, you can always buy an Android phone. Um, right. Once you once you're in the Apple ecosystem, they're absolutely a monopoly. But they don't have yeah. anywhere near that's how, that's how, so 50 percent of the market. They don't even, they barely have. How know, much of the profit in the market do they have? Well, they have almost all the profit. There you go. I Look, we could, the but problem is. But you punish somebody for that? No. <laughs> you don't punish someone for that. You punish them for bad business behavior elsewhere 
that is because they have this dominant market that they can take advantage of and are. Yeah. It, it's it, these are two different things. Anyway, we've gotten completely sidetracked on this. <laughs> what were we talking the about? Oh yeah, Activision Blizzard. <laughs> the second half of this. Oh, I should just say, just to wrap that up, you're wrong about everything. No. Yes. Is that? <laughs> no, I'll accept that. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. Um, I get just no, as it, mad like, at Alex Lindsay when he says it as you're getting. This at me, is so. I just, no, no. Look, this <laughs> I understand. Is a, this, your, I understand. This what is you're a saying. a great debate of. Our I think it's complicated. Point. I don't think it's it is, completely it is obvious. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like it is, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, my point about the App Store stuff is Smith doesn't really offer any um, solution. <laughs> you know, yeah. what he seems to say is if we have more content, maybe they'll take us more seriously. And Apple will never do that. No. I, you don't have to know too much about no. Apple to know that they're very no. obstinate. No. So there's that. But the other half of the story, of course, is Sony. Now, Sony, like I said, has infamously been the one company that's kind of been like, hello, we're the only ones that don't want this to happen. It's like, okay, well, what's the problem? Well, PlayStation is a big deal for us. You know, this PlayStation, Sony took Xbox, hello, took Call of Duty away from Xbox as an exclusive platform several years ago. There was a, a couple of year period where it was, that was really bad. So what would happen is like a new Call of Duty game would come out on day one. So it'd be available everywhere. And then uh, DLC would start happening. So map packs and, you know, different content, whatever it was, would occur through the year. And Xbox would get it like a month later. There was one year, I'm not going to remember the exact details of this, but a, a new Call of Duty game was coming out at the end of October. And on October 1st, Xbox got the final DLC that Sony had gotten, you know, six weeks earlier or something like that. It was like, it was past the point. It was just like, it was pointless to even put it out. You know, it was just kind of, um, you know, indic indicative of the problem. Now, I don't know what changed, but it's fair to say that over the past, um, I don't know, two, three years, whatever the time frame's been, honestly, the DLC stuff is kind of ironed out. I don't know if maybe the Sony agreement had some kind of a limit on it or something, but the way things work now, for the most part, is uh, I'm sure you get something for being on PlayStation. I'm not really sure what that is, but um, we tend to get map packs and DLC and stuff like that day and day, you know, so that that's kind of been nice. So, so what's Sony's like, what's the, what's the worry here? Well, we're afraid that Microsoft is going to take Call of Duty away from PlayStation. PlayStation uh, is, that's a huge part of our platform. It would have a material impact on us. This is the only way they can compete. You know, they're going to take this thing for, away from us. Microsoft, we talked about this. We talked about this every week since, <laughs> probably since the analysis. Microsoft has said again and again, we will never take... <laughs> Play, Call of Duty off a PlayStation doesn't make any sense. So Brad Smith in his letter said a couple of things. He made he he, he humorously. I'm not sure a lot of people understood this uh, comparison. He compared Sony to Blockbuster when Netflix arrived. And when I say Netflix in this case, I don't mean the Netflix we know today. I mean the original Netflix when it was a DVD delivery service. Remember that? Um, Blockbuster was the biggest video rental chain in the world, well, in the country anyway, uh, probably in the world, but in the, in the country. And Netflix arrived and you could get DVDs via, via mail. It was kind of nice. So Blockbuster tried a couple of different things, but one of the things they did right before they went under <laughs> was they started a Netflix style DVD mail, DVD, you know, a, a mail in DVD thing, right? So you could choose how many you got per month. It was like one, two or three or something like that. Or at a, I'm sorry, not a month. It was at a time. And the quicker you turn these things over, the quicker you could get the next stuff in your queue, just like on Netflix. But Blockbuster had one major advantage over Netflix back then. They had stores. So if, if you had DVDs that you got in the mail from Blockbuster, you could bring them back to a store, right? So you could just maybe less than 30 minutes away. And they would give you as many DVDs as you had brought in. So you could go walk to the store, pick out two movies in my case. And I used to do this. Like I actually used Blockbuster for a while because it was actually a better deal. Now, flash forward to today, I think we all know Blockbuster is not around anymore, right? And and so by comparing Sony, the market leader, by the way, right? By comparing Sony to Blockbuster, this is kind of a kind of an underhanded dig. You know, in other words, what they're saying is Sony is so married to the old way of doing things that they don't understand that the world is about to change and they're not going to change with it. And what they're trying to do is prevent Xbox subscribers from getting these games day and date on Xbox Game Pass, which is a subscription service, or on Xbox Cloud Gaming, which is that cloud streaming service, which is part of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate.
Um, they w- what they would like is for Activision to remain what they are, ship discs out or digital downloads and have it just be the same everywhere because Sony doesn't really have a service. They do technically, of course, but they, they're they not on the same footing with Xbox Game Pass. They're behind on that kind of thing. And uh, so I thought that was funny, but okay, whatever. But he did confirm that Microsoft went to Sony and said, we will give you a 10-year contract for Call of Duty. We will guarantee that we release every everything we do for Call of Duty. We'll do it on PlayStation. And Sony never responded. Oh, they didn't answer. Yeah. They didn't accept. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't even didn't If we even accept it, then our, uh, our entire premise would be uh, faulty. Yeah. The thing is, uh, and I kind of have this later in the notes, but I, I, the thing we lose sight of, and I lose sight of, because I, I think about this in terms of Call of Duty, this isn't really about Call of Duty. I, yes, Call of Duty is probably the most successful, well, one of the most successful franchises that Activision Blizzard has, of course. But really, this is about Microsoft looking at what is the future gaming. That's why they're getting into game streaming. But the current gaming situation and, and going forward in the future um, a bigger chunk of it is mobile, and they have no presence in mobile whatsoever. So here you have this company that has a great brand, Xbox. Everyone knows about it. They're losing in consoles. They have a, a cloud streaming service that Apple is preventing them from using on their devices. You can do it through a browser, um, you know, preventing it from going into the App Store, which, like you said, is where people expect to find things. Um, they don't have any mobile games of their own. They don't have anything. So this is really what they're buying. What they're they're going to spend almost seventy billion dollars to get a foothold in mobile gaming, and Microsoft's he, Brad Smith didn't really say this, but Microsoft has been such a good steward of games and has done such a good job of living up to what is Microsoft's kind of slogan for everything, but just in the context of gaming, meeting gamers where they are. They took Minecraft, everyone freaked out. They made it available everywhere. Yeah, it's on, by the way, it's on Xbox Game Pass and it's on cloud streaming. You do that stuff, it, but it's everywhere else too. We didn't take it away from anywhere. Well, actually they did take it away from, <laughs> I think it did disappear somewhere, but basically it's in, it's in more places now than it's ever been. They, t they brought back Microsoft Flight Simulator, which was a PC only title back in the day. Put it on console, only on the newest generation, but then put it on Game Pass and cloud gaming, meaning you could play it on uh, previous generation console, Xbox One, and on mobile, right? I mean, that's what Microsoft is doing. Their their whole thing is like we don't we don't really do great in consoles. We just we just talked about the fact they lose money on every console they sell. Um, they don't think the market's going to shift, you know, overnight. They know PC gaming is still a big thing. They're they're playing a role there as well uh, with Xbox Game Pass and with their own first party titles. But mobile is mobile's the big thing. Mobile is is personal computing today. They want to be on mobile. And that's what this is about. So in the wake of this, um, we learned, I think, last night or today that Microsoft has a team of people going to Washington, or they're in Washington, D.C. right now, presumably to talk to the FTC, which is the antitrust body, the regulatory body that had indicated that we might be blocking this. And they would block it by basically filing a lawsuit to prevent this acquisition from happening. Um, I believe that, you know, the way th this would work is there's they must have some committee or panel or whatever, and they they everyone votes and a majority rules, whatever it is. Uh, we've there have been rumors in recent days that people are now waffling that people on this panel or whatever it is have previously were saying, "Oh, we're not going to allow this." Have looked at it more closely and said, "You know what? Actually, I, we don't see any problems with this." And I think what they're going to go to them with is two things: one. What they've their information about the stuff that he said publicly, whatever, and then a separate <laughs> this is cl classic uh, announcement that came very late last night that Microsoft has now reached separate agreements with both Nintendo and Steam for that ten year Call of Duty promise that they're going to put this game on their platforms for ten years. We offered Sony the same thing. Sony didn't answer us. Do you see what's going on here? Like we're trying to do the right thing and Sony is just trying to block it. So this is though, uh, you might argue exactly the point of the FTC is to push mm -hmm. 
things like this. Microsoft may not yes. have made these 10 year deals with any of these companies if they well. weren't in you know, faces. <laughs> and by the way, they still have to get through the EU. And the EU, I don't oh, know yeah. if they're yeah, going to yeah. be uh, agreeable or not. Yep. But same thing. I, I, I've i sort of, look, this is like the, the conversation about where, where app fees should be. Apple and Google want them to be as, as high as possible. Um, Microsoft, it, it, actually, it's a little different because, you know, economically, it makes sense for Microsoft to put this game on PlayStation forever, right? Is, assuming PlayStation doesn't fall off a cliff, um, it would be suicide for this platform to take it off of PlayStation. It's the most popular platform for Call of Duty. Um, but yes, I, I think that... I think that... Microsoft actually always intended to make some form yeah, of concession they knew they'd have like to. this. This negotiation they, is was going to happen. They knew that. There's no way to know what the numbers were in their right. head. There was there was a rumor. Actually, I think Phil Spencer de denied this, but there was a rumor some couple of months ago where Microsoft had gone to them and said, "How about four years?" You know, and they were like, four <laughs> years? What are you talking about? Like four four years is nothing." And then he he did come out at the time and made the comment like, it, "We can't. We literally can't make a contract that says forever." However, as long as there is a PlayStation, we will make a call of, whatever the Call of Duty is, we will make it for PlayStation. Which is not a big and, concession, frankly, right? I mean, that's well, they make a lot of money in that, I think. But my, but Sony's argument is that they want to take it off of The exclusive would be more and valuable than, so, than selling it on every platform. I'm not sure I agree. I mean, you just said how important it is to sell it on mobile. Why, well, you know, I don't know. If yeah, but the, so the, the, well, until and unless mobile and console and PC somehow become one thing, in other words, like when I play Call of Duty online, it's a different I'm actually game. Playing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a different game, but I'm also playing, but not, but one thing has changed. Like one thing has evolved. I'm actually playing against people on Xbox, obviously, but also on PlayStation, which is not new, but not on iPad. PC, no, no, but <laughs> also PCs, but PCs yeah. as well. Yeah. So that's actually very interesting. So, when I play the game, I haven't done it in a while, actually, but when, I, when I've when i played the Call of Duty mobile on an iPad, honestly, one of the most striking things about it is how well they've uh, kind of emulated the experience, if you will, and then how beautiful the game is. Like, th this game looks fantastic on mobile, and they did that thing that I've wanted for years and years, which is you go back to the catalog of maps, and you cherry pick the That's you know, 10 or 20. Yeah, yeah it's, it's awesome having the best maps of all time on that thing, so... Is there a future where maybe uh, these things come together? I will say if you allow Call of Duty on Xbox game streaming, and somehow it works, I, first person shooters streaming is a little tough, but if you could, multiplayer, I mean, maybe impossible. But if you could somehow make that work, there's no reason a person on an iPad couldn't be playing with PC players and console players because it's the same. It's a streaming game. Yeah, that yeah, would yeah. be the same yeah, game, right? Yeah, so yeah. anyway, it's... We'll see. We'll see what happens. But they still got to get through the UK. They still got to get through the EU. Yeah. Lena yeah. Khan uh, was asked last week. She's the chairman of the FTC and the one who's the most aggressively uh, antitrust um, right. uh, was asked about it. She said, I can't talk about Activision Blizzard. Let me mm -hmm. see if I can find the quote here because I thought it was interesting. She says, look, if they're going to put Microsoft Word on the Sony PlayStation, you know, we can talk about it. She, no, no, she did not say that. <laughs> she said the top priority is preserving in, um, innovation in emerging markets. In no case, in no case, could you say this is an emerging market of any kind? No. Uh, she says, "I." This is the quote from the Wall Street Journal CEO summit. I think there can be this misperception: the FTC is somehow anti deals, but when you have increased consolidation, increased concentration, and declining competition, that can have a real adverse effect on innovation. Incumbents and monopolists are not going to be incentivized to innovate and really push the boundaries in the way that they are when they're facing robust competition. I, does that mean, I don't know what it would be in this market, a new game console? That's that's That ship has sailed. Um, a new game company? No, because you're going to end up putting it on those platforms. Your partner, well, not not competitor. I don't, what I don't know it? how this would save anybody's innovation. Yeah. No, I, look... I, I, we should just be clear about this. Um, this benefits Microsoft, right? I, I know that's obvious, but I just like step through it for a second. So Microsoft has these subscription services, which have kind of stalled, right? It's always been kind of interesting to me when they were still reporting numbers that Xbox Live Gold kind of hit 45 million 
and never went anywhere from there. And so now they tried this new strategy. They get like a three tier Xbox Game Pass uh, subscription, $9.99, $9.99 and $14.99. The expensive one offers game streaming. Everyone's game streaming is the future. Oh my God, maybe it's finally going to happen. Year or two goes by and it's like, okay, well, actually this is always going to be a small part of our market too, <laughs> you know, but you got to look at it as part of a giant, I don't know, pie or something where it's just part of the puzzle. You know, it's uh, Microsoft has games on PC. They have games on Xbox. They have games on mobile. They have games that they put sometimes on other platforms. Um, Steam is not another platform in the sense that it's, you know, PC, but they do put games on Steam. With this acquisition, they'll have games on Sony. Um, but the way that this benefits them is it gives them more of an audience, more um, incentive for people to pay for a subscription because a much bigger library of games will be there. Like Bethesda was a nice step up. Um, they have that uh, agreement with EA for certain things. But this would be like a, a monumental increase in quality and, and volume. And uh, that would benefit them. And okay, fine. But like they've said, like we're we're third in consoles. We have zero in mobile. What what's the, you know, we talk about monopolies and duopolies and blah blah blah. But what there's no, we have nothing in this market. We the the only market we're currently competing in we're nowhere. So what's the problem? <laughs> like yeah, we're a big company, but as far as this market goes, we're we're not nothing, but we're not we're not a majority of anything. So there's that. So yes, I, yeah, Microsoft benefits, of course. Why else would they buy something? Um, Sony, I think it hurts Sony a little bit in the sense that they're already kind of behind in cloud streaming and cloud gaming, whatever you want to call it, uh, subscription type stuff. Um, there's no reason they couldn't catch up I, or, you know, do well there. Um, maybe one of the agreements should be Microsoft should have to put this on Sony's streaming service at whatever the going rate is for that kind of a thing. Maybe they could do that. Um, I don't know, but I feel like guaranteeing to any regula regulator, whatever country they're from, that we have no, pl we will put it in writing. We are not walking away from Sony, from the PlayStation. I think that should be enough. I don't understand why we're talking about these other things. Yeah. You know? All right, let's take a little break. Uh, we do have uh, many, many things to talk about before the end of the show, and I want to get to them. Yeah, all. I just uh, so people know, I wanted to get that done up front. There is some more Xbox stuff. Um <laughs> I just felt like this was such a big deal. It's, it's a big it, story. It, it's a Microsoft story because it's it's happening. This it's is happening the future right of Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's legit. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about CDW and Lenovo. Lenovo orchestrated by the experts at CDW, our sponsor. The helpful people at CDW understand that as the world changes, your organization has to adapt quickly if it wants to succeed, right? So, how can CDW help keep your business ahead of the curve? Well, how about with Lenovo ThinkPads? Well, I love me some ThinkPads. These powerful devices deliver the business class performance you're looking for thanks to Windows 10 and the Intel Evo platform. With your remote teams working across the country, around the world, collaboration isn't a problem because Lenovo ThinkPads keep your organization productive and connected from anywhere. Plus, CDW knows your workforce has different work styles, needs flexibility. That's why Lenovo ThinkPads are equipped with responsive tools and built-in features let your team work seamlessly across their favorite tools. Now, think about that for a second. Oh, let's not forget about security. While you're thinking of that, these high-performing machines protect at the highest level with built-in hardware to guard against modern threats without slowing your team down. When you need to get more out of technology, Lenovo makes seamless productivity possible, and CDW makes it powerful. Learn more at cdw.com slash Lenovo client. cdw.com slash Lenovo client. We thank him so much for supporting Windows Weekly, uh, and we thank you for supporting us by using that address so they know you saw it here. cdw.com slash Lenovo client. Let's talk about Windows. What's new yeah. in the world of Windows? Not a lot, actually. Um, we have beta, and I believe dev builds in the past week, neither of which have any new features. Um, however, there has been a persnickety game performance issue on Windows 11 that's, 
apparently been a problem since there's been a Windows 11. If I understand the history of this, it's been pretty bad. Um, sometime in the, I don't know if it was this past uh, month or the month before, but fairly recently there was a, um, I keep calling it stable channel. I don't know what to call it, but a, a, a stable channel um, cumulative update that supposedly was going to go a long way to fixing this problem. It's not the case. <laughs> so in the beta channel now, uh, the beta channel, remember they have the two builds because some have new features, some don't. Uh, of course, with this particular build, there are no new features, so they're the same, but they have different build numbers. Um, they are apparently going to fix this. So if you're in the beta channel and you have the latest build, you should have a fix for the issues that have been affecting uh, games, but also anything that's like GPU intensive. Um, and we'll see. So uh, if you've been using <laughs> Windows 10 um, and not Windows 11 for this reason, um, soon, I don't know, will it be next Tuesday? Probably not, but sometime soon, um, there should be a fix for that. So nothing new to say. Those. This uh, is not related to the uh, edge freezing thing you were talking about on the in Intel 12th generation. No, and actually, since you bring that up. We got um, so much mail from people saying, yep, see the same thing. You were absolutely yeah. confirmed in your experience. Yeah. I, I, so it's not just that, I, but that is the most obvious and frequent thing that happens, right? There, there's actually other issues. It's For me, it's tied largely to using some kind of a Docker hub, but it's not just that, right? I have other weird performance issues um, on 12th gen systems only, you know? So I've been experimenting with different things, using a different browser. Of course, I talked about Firefox last week, um, using different computers that don't run on the 12th gen chipset. When I was in Mexico, I was using a laptop that I think was 10th gen or maybe 11th, but no problems whatsoever. Dock, didn't matter which dock I used, was great. Um, this past weekend, I switched uh, the computer we're using for the show from an NV16, uh, which is a 12th gen, I think, 8 series processor, to this computer, which is uh, an AMD Ryzen of some kind. Actually, I should just look at it. I'm not sure what it is. Um, Ryzen 7 Pro, 80, uh, 6850U. So kind of their take on the U series processor, right? So just a bit your basic Ultrabook kind of processor. No problems whatsoever. So um, I, like I said, I, I've also gotten some feedback from other some people. I've never talked to... PC makers about this and I should. And I actually, I do have that capability. So I will do that. Um, I don't know how much, I'd have to find someone who'd be willing to talk off the record. I'm not really sure. Yeah, nobody's going to dis Intel. <laughs> well, yeah. And by, by the way, it's not 100% clear it's Intel's fault, right? Intel did change the architecture, but Microsoft is responsible for the system. So it might be something Windows oh, yeah. 11 related. It's so what other thing I could, yeah. I, I'm working on a Windows 11 book, right? So I can't really just, play with Windows 10 every day, I have to be in Windows 11. Um, but that would be another thing I could kind of take a look at, right? I mean, there's lots of variables. That's what makes this really hard. I don't want to be 100%, you know, I know it's this. It's just that I've used so many 12th gen systems this year, and the problem is so obvious. And like I said, I think last week, I, I'm surprised no one reviewing laptops that I've seen has ever come out and said, this is, there's something going on here. Instead, what you see is, I ran this benchmark, it's 10 to 15 to 20% faster than last year, blah, blah, and then you move on. And it's like, uh, that's cute. But, you know, when I actually use it, I have these problems. So, anyhow. And I it's don't... edge only, right? Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Any no, chromium. No, chromium. Chromium based Chromium based browsers. thing, yeah. Yeah. So, well, I guess I said, it could be chromium, too. Yep. Yeah. The, yeah. Don't, I, yeah I don't, that's what's hard, hard to figure I, I don't want to test one thing and say, I solved it. So right. AMD fixes everything. Right. Like, you know, but, but. You know, um, I did I did not have this problem with Windows 11 on ARM in Mexico. I brought uh, a Lenovo laptop that ran that system. So yeah, it just ran slow all around. So who cares, right? Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, you didn't notice anything. <laughs> you can, no slowdowns. It's uh, slow in general. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, now this would be obvious even then because it's a it's a like a hesitation, right? It just well. It, uh, well, the way I just, so I, I think I told the story, but uh, on a typical show like this, like when we go into a new uh, segment of the show, I'll like preload these stories in the browser tabs, right. right? And as we finish the story, uh, you know, I'll control W and get rid of it. When I did that before, the browser would hang and it would sit there for 
30 seconds maybe, which doesn't sound like a lot of time, except when you're doing a live show and you have to move to the next topic, that's a long time. So what I started doing was not closing the browser tabs because I was like, I can't, mm -hmm. I, can't afford, I can't afford this time. And then you would do an ad and I'd try to close a few. Um, it got to be a real problem. So I am... I just closed the tab I needed, God damn it. Um, I, <laughs> I have been on this show just closing the tab. A little demonstration, normally. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm using an AMD system. It closed uh, fine, okay. right? No problems yeah. at all. Yeah. I'm using Microsoft Edge, by the way. So <laughs> that's I so weird. I, all I have is I have evidence. I have theories. I, I absolutely don't have a, a fact to say it is this. I can't say it's this, but I have my suspicions yeah. and uh, I've, Voice I mean, it could so. be an interaction between those systems, but it definitely All goes away if you're not using Intel. So yep. Intel yep. seems to be the culprit. Which is why I've, yeah. And, and I don't want to tunnel vision it. I'm trying to be objective here. Um, but yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, that you look, you're right, right. You look where you, where you see the problem. I, uh, the problem, well, no, it still happens, but it was agreed. Like when, when these things, when I first, the first few that I got, I was really, I was kind of freaking out how bad it was. And of course, I talked about the whole thing where they added this P series. Um, I, I, I finally got a couple of U series machines, and I thought, man, these are going to be horrible if the the you know the more powerful ones are not working well. But actually, they're okay. They they seem to be okay. They're not any any worse, I guess. I, don't, I can't. <laughs> we have lowered our expectations. You know, the good news is it's not any worse. I mean, if you if you like your browser hanging, it's just <laughs> as good. I mean, you can save some money. You get the same hang. It hangs just as well. Yeah. It hangs good. It hangs just as good. I've tried everything. I've tried efficiency mode. That's so and, weird. You know, stuff. I've tried all kinds of stuff. So uh, if you're out there and you're a PC maker, maybe you're even an Intel person, mm -hmm. and Call you me. think you have some ideas, mm -hmm. your your personal uh, anonymity will I, be guaranteed. Yes. I, I I went through a lot of stuff with this. I'm, I, I could just babble about this for two hours. I... I if, one of the first machines I got had some kind of custom. I think it was an HP. They had a custom, um, like a power management thing going on, like their own power management that overrid what was in Windows. I thought maybe it was that. Um, I looked at deleting the app that controlled it, and see, I tried all kinds of different stuff. But eventually, I started piling up machines, and I realized, no, this is this is happening everywhere. It hangs like, just as good. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> save, save some money. Save Windows some eleven. Money. An Intel 12th gen. It hangs just as good. I really think it's a, I don't know, scheduling might be, I'm not a hardware guy. Scheduling really sounds right. You know, especially because problem. you have these performance and efficiency cores and you're That's going right. back and forth. That's my guess. Something's going on there. Yeah, that sounds Maybe perfect. someone knows. Uh, someone, if they, we don't have to <laughs> go on for another half hour, but if someone knows, Discord, email, however they want to do it. Um, when it, when AMD switched to kind of a multi-core system, right? They're not, I know it's not really hybrid like ARM, but they, they, and I don't know enough about hardware to know, are they really just doing a thing that's like hyper-threading slash cores? Is it really, you know, but it seems like AMD uh, machines now have, you know, it's not dual quad core. It's, they have eight, six, 13, 12, you know, lots of cores. I wonder if when AMD switched to this kind of thing, if they, if those machines ever experienced mm, interesting yeah. scheduling issues, I don't know. I don't, I never, I don't use enough of them to know. Well, it's a good story. Do you do do you do signal? Do you have any sort of like super encrypted way to be in touch? No. Oh no, uh, no for this. No, I don't. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm on DM Mastodon. Him. DM him on Mastodon. DM Mastodon. You can, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> hey, by the still. way, welcome, um, welcome. I saw you signed yeah, up, and yeah. we welcome you into the Twit Social f embrace, yeah. the warm embrace yeah. of Twit Social. Started following people. I boost things sometimes. Oh, do you toot? Trying to do you toot yeah, and I toot, boost? I toot, I've, dude, I, every night I toot. <laughs> and I, I had to throw out some sheets the other day because I was tooting too much. <laughs> yeah, when uh, a toot becomes a boost. <laughs> I boosted that toot. Uh, oh, oh boy! I mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> moving, moving right along. Yes. Sorry. Uh, and speaking of things that haven't changed anything, uh, Microsoft released version 108 of Edge, the web browser, to stable. Um, there are no new features for end users. Um, there's some new stuff in there for IT pros. Um, we better hurry up with this show or they're going to get to 806 faster, 807 faster than we do. Get to 1,000. <laughs> they're at version 108. 
Of course, it's tied to Chromium's versions, so it's the same. Yeah, so right. it's every four weeks now, yeah. right? So it was six, every six weeks for a while. Now it's every four weeks. Yeah, um, yeah we're not going to get big changes uh, every month, I guess we're calling yeah. it. Um, there, I didn't write about this because I just didn't really see the point of it, but uh, Microsoft Edge now has over 11%, 11 I'm going to call it usage share in November, according to the stat counter, which is the highest it's ever been. Wow. Yeah. I know it's not great, <laughs> but on desktop, the number two, uh, if you're in all two. the places. We're yeah. number two. Distant number two. They're uh, <laughs> they're not even the Burger King. They're kind of the RC Cola <laughs> to Chrome's uh, Coca-Cola. But um, but whatever, number two is number, number two. Number two is number I two, it, yeah. If you factor in all platforms, I, I'm sure they're number three after Safari, I think. And uh, Well, that's the problem. It's Safari. mobile. You know, you've yeah. got yeah, the Apple me. monopoly. There you go. Now that we've agreed... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for finally coming around to that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, boy, uh, I feel like I should take another break. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to be okay. bold. I know yeah. it's a little quick, well, but we, okay. we thank God we have advertisers. So that's well, the thing. And this one's a good one because everybody needs to know about Rocket Money. And I know this because it saves me, actually saved me more than a thousand dollars, I have to admit it, <laughs> over the last year or two. Uh, it used to be called True Bill. Maybe you've used True Bill. Rocket bought it, made it rocket money. It's better than ever. Got lots more features. You know, you can use it to keep track of your finances, to budget, to know what your net worth is, to keep track of your investments, all that stuff. But the best feature, I just gotta, I just gotta say, the best feature is. It also lets you find out what subscriptions you've forgotten about. 80% of people say they have subscriptions they just, you know, they forgot about. Happens to me all the time. I still subscribe to that newspaper, that magazine, that streaming channel. Wait a minute, I'm paying, in my case, <laughs> I was paying a lot of money to a campaign from 2020. You know, that they do when you do the campaign donations. They check, they have a box that's checked that said, make this recurring, and I missed it, I guess. I thought it was a one-time only deal. Thank goodness Rocket Money told me, you know, Leo, in fact, it was on one of the shows. I saw, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, Leo, there's a tab that says recurring payments. And you go there and sometimes it's kind of a revelation. They surveyed uh, people and they found out that on average, most Americans spend about $200 a month. Much of that probably wasted on subscriptions you no longer use, you don't care about, or you've forgotten about, or worse, are duplicates. Here's the best part. You find them on Rocket Money, and then you cancel them in Rocket Money. There's a cancel button. And I'll impress it. Rocket Money takes care of the rest. It has saved me so much money over the years. At first is True Bill, and now is Rocket Money. I, you know, I was really pleased, actually, when I uh, I saw the, the new icon and the new name, and I thought, oh, and they've added so many features. Rocket Money is awesome. I want you to try it. Just if, if nothing else, to get rid of these ridiculous subscriptions that just go on and on and on. Get rid of useless subscriptions right now with Rocket Money. Go to rocketmoney.com slash windows. Seriously, it could save you hundreds a year. Now, I know you're smart and you're listening and you're saying, oh, I could just go to the App Store. No, please. <laughs> Please don't go to the Google Play Store or the App Store. Don't do that because then they won't know you saw it here. Just before you go to the App Store, go to rocketmoney.com slash windows. Actually, they give you a link. They make it easy. Do it on your phone. That way it's easy and you can install it from there. Maybe I would say marginally easier than searching for it. Rocketmoney.com slash windows. Cancel those unnecessary subscriptions right now. It's just sensible. Rocketmoney.com slash windows. Although if Microsoft had offered a ugly sweater subscription, I might well have signed up for that. <laughs> I would like, I like having these. This is a nice ugly sweater. Uh, Paul Therott, Leo Laporte. We're talking windows. We're talking Microsoft. We're fighting like cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> like Apple and Google. Like Apple World and Google. Uh, let's talk about Microsoft 365. -er. Yeah, so speaking of anti-competitive behavior, uh -oh. Microsoft decided to add Discord to Teams and not pay Discord for I, it. I, this is really interesting. That's not true. It's not Discord. <laughs> no. But I did see this this morning. They're going to add, and it's for free, right? Right. Discord-like features to Teams for groups and, and families and stuff like that. That's fascinating to me because this is 
clearly for teams like the version no one actually uses, the version in Windows, the version for consumers. Oh, it's not the. Um, it's not like the. It's not all I, all of Teams. Well, I mean, look, they put games into Teams for enterprise and education. So yeah, this is going to come to all Teams, I guess. But it, it today it's launching for the free version of Teams that you can get on mobile. The the only other free version, so to speak, is um, in Windows. And they say right? that'll because be coming the, soon, right? That's that's next. Yeah, of course. Um, so it's interesting they're doing it on mobile. Again, go to where the users are, right? So you start with the most important platform, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then you kind of look at how they describe, you know, what is this thing? So when you think about Teams or Slack or anything like that, obviously you've got this organization where you have groups of people or employees usually who are maybe working on a project or part of the same business unit. So they're in these groups that were within Teams and they actually call them teams. Of course they do. Um, this is sort of like, I have to say, I, I, I don't, I, I sort of don't like the idea of teams for consumers, but this communities feature, which is the name of it, is kind of like ad hoc teams, lowercase t, for individuals. So you can start, in other words, you start a group, you're like, I'm into this sports team. I'm in, I, we're planning an event. So there's a parent teacher conference going on, or, you know, or you're a small business or whatever it might be. Um, I, honestly, I, that, okay. okay. <laughs> like that actually makes sense to me. I, I don't like the brand teams for people like you know, for non, you know, work type things, but this, this feature is a step toward making teams for consumers as a concept kind of makes sense to me, I guess. So yeah, it's free. And that that's maybe the most interesting part. So um, we use Teams at work, but of course we are paying for some form of Microsoft 365 license or subscription for every user who's on this team. Like that's how that works. You can connect to outside users as well, but if they're using Microsoft Teams, uh, I shouldn't say this, I'm not 100% sure I would have, I'm actually not 100% sure. So I think you could probably connect to someone outside your organization through Teams. It's possible they wouldn't have to pay for Teams to use it like that. But for the most part, people who who use Teams are paying for Teams, right? So this is kind of an expansion of the free version. And I would say from a functional standpoint, it's a it's actually a really big expansion beyond the usual stuff that you would expect from a chat based utility, right? So you can have, you know, video calls, audio calls, text chat, et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of the next level. And I, I have to, I'm surprised to say I don't have a problem with this. Like this seems like this is no this effect. Like I'm pretty, tempted to try it. Yeah. It seems like a Isn't pretty that good wild. Idea. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it being on mobile only for right now is makes it a lot less interesting to me personally, but it's going to, you know, it will spread. So uh, we'll see. But yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling. They said I'm not specifically that, I, that it would come to desktop next. You know, it's like not just around the yeah, corner yeah, or something. Yeah. Know? Yep. Yep. So yeah. really, this is clearly a bid to get consumers to use Teams. Yes. And honestly, that's very interesting to me because, uh, you know, chat for Microsoft Teams is the client is called in. Windows 11, and you can download it from the web for Windows 10, never made a lot of sense, right? It's this thing, they put it on your taskbar. I think people kind of look at it and they're like, well, I was using Skype maybe because I'm a Microsoft person. It doesn't just bring in my, my, my Skype stuff for some reason. Like that doesn't make a lot of sense. And what is this thing? Or I, or maybe I used, I do use, I'm one of the 400 and whatever million people that use teams at work and wait, this is doesn't connect to that for some reason. So you're telling me I need to download a second Teams to use in Windows 11, which you do, <laughs> and okay. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it never made a lot of sense. And when you look at whatever improvements Microsoft has made to Windows 11 since last October, year ago, October, I don't think they've, I can't think of a single change they've made to Teams. So this is the first big one. So, or it will be when it happens on Windows 11. But um, yeah, this looks... I think this looks interesting. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I'm curious about things like sharing. If you have media, like I want to, we had an event and, you know, Bob took 250 pictures and this guy took 150 pictures. Can we put them all there and let people get them? And if this is a free service, how does that work? Um, it, this know. is definitely a loss leader because uh, I remember them to saying them you could teams, share yeah. media and stuff. I mean, uh, they've, this is yeah. it's on free. Um, this I think is going to have a lot um, of features. But remember, Discord is free as well. 
And right. The, and the way right. they get you, you know, the way they, they monetize is they get you to upgrade. Right. Although Discord did just add a subscription tier, so I wonder if maybe that's not working so well. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so cynical. I, I see this kind of cause and effect that's probably not real. And that cause and effect is back in, uh, I don't know, February, March or something, Microsoft said some number. We, we have some number of people on Microsoft Teams, and they have been providing these updates for a long time, you know, since Teams was a thing. And Teams growth has had slowed, for sure, which makes sense. It's in the hundreds of millions now. And then they never provided another, another number. And when they did their earnings back in probably October, or I guess it would have come out in November, whatever it was, um, they used the same figure from the spring. And it was like, huh, what's going on there? And it, this leads me to wonder if this isn't some attempt to keep, like, so they can come out later and say, oh, yeah, we had a, we got a big boost <laughs> in teams because they'll, you know, they'll combine these all together into one thing. I don't know. I, that's probably not true, but that's how my brain works. Like. That would Seems imply that they were highly sensitive to the lack of yeah. uptake of teams. Well, if you think there isn't someone monitoring a dashboard every single day that <laughs> shows them, I, I mean, I honestly, I think they are very sensitive. They've got a that, McDonald's so. yeah. style billboard. We have there. served. Yeah. Ching, One ching. million yeah, exactly. served. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I mean, I, again, like I said, I'm, my, my brain's broken, but yeah. Anyway, I'm glad they're doing it. I love, thing. you know, it's. Yeah. Why look a gift horse in the mouth? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a holiday. <laughs> well, hold on a second. That's, that's um, yeah. There's this guy on the road that says he'll give us some free beans. Yeah, I let's know, take it. That, let's take it. Look, what look could that gift horse possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah, um, I, we'll find out. It's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I thought, oh, I gotta ask Paul about that. That's, and I, and it's funny. It works because I have no desire to use Teams at all, but that makes it more right. interesting. Now you're talking. I, but partly that's because I love Discord. We use uh, Discord. Yeah. I would never really used it until we started Club Twit. And I now have, I live in it. I love it. It's I, have, I have so many different things. I mean, you know, it, you know, Twitter and Mastodon are not chat clients. But, you know, as far as things I kind of monitor all day long, you know, I've got Skype They're similar. It's very similar, yeah. Teams, you know. Raphael recently asked me why I wasn't on like the team's client in windows. So I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, I don't, I already have like eight different ways to reach you. I don't, why, why would I want another one? You know, um, it would be neat if there were more, like there were fewer of these things with more people on each, I guess. Um, but yeah. Galia, who is in our discord said, you should mm -hmm. look a gift horse in the mouth because a horse is badly raised and this has bad teeth might cost more than it's worth to you as a gift. Well, I, th I think Galia had some childhood trauma. I don't know. That is that's a very li uh, that's a literal <laughs> this oddly take on specific. This, this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really, Galia? Right. Okay. Do you have any idea how how expensive dental work is on a horse? <laughs> no, I don't. That, I, I was just a. <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> All right. You thought you had enough Xbox before, right? Get ready. It's no, time one, for Xbox the. Conjuring or the reckoning, the, or the, <laughs> the right, right. What are they? What is that uh, movie? What do they do when they say the second one is the the well, it's part do part do like hot, you know? Yeah, hot takes part do. Yeah, hit me, hit me, hit me. Yeah, I don't remember the timing of this either, but the past year or two, uh, mainline or mainstream AAA games on new gen consoles have gone up from fifty nine ninety nine to sixty nine ninety nine. Right, so. For example, the new Call of Duty is is seventy bucks. Like that's the starting price, and so that's kind of the way the world's been going. Um, obviously, that's expensive. But Microsoft, I saw this headline and I I got nervous. I saw actually they emailed me and I said, "Oh, this is it. This is the console price hike." But no, that what Microsoft announced was that starting in twenty twenty three, the price of first party, um, meaning Microsoft made or Microsoft Studio made AAA titles. Will be seventy dollars, you know, sixty nine ninety nine um, instead of sixty in the U.S. and you know, different countries, different prices. But um, that's the way the world has gone. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, they all but con uh, confirm Phil Spencer, not Spectre, that uh, they would almost certainly be raising the prices on the consoles as well next year. Um, there was a big sale on Xbox Series S, as you may recall, over Black Friday. Um, I hope if you wanted one, you got it, um, because at some point, those prices are going to go up. I mean, there's just no no doubt about it. So we know that the game prices are going up to start. 
So you mentioned today is a day that will live in infamy. Well, I I tell you, please look at the <laughs> the 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 graphic Microsoft chose for this story. Uh oh, <laughs> which is that Microsoft Flight Simulator cross crosses 10 million pilots, as they call call them, gamers, users, right? Um, since its debut uh, two years this ago. This is the so. anniversary, of course, of uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, right. In fact, it's a big anniversary, isn't it? It's the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Oh, boy. Is that right? No, I think I'm, it is. Wasn't uh, it 1940? Right? Well, no, it was 40, Was it 41 or 42? No, no. It can't. It was not 41, but... Well, December 7th. I know that much. I, I would have said... I would have said... And if you looked in the skies of Honolulu... No, you're right. I'm sorry. You're, you're it right. It would have looked just like this. <laughs> yep. No. It's like, guys, I, listen, <laughs> no. maybe maybe an in-plane view or something. Like, I, it, it looks like... <laughs> Here they come. Flight simulator games are... Uh, that that one in the middle though isn't that the spruce goose that we talked about? That's it the looks like a yeah, Howard Hughes yeah, the big, plane, the big boy, yes. world's largest wooden yeah, plane. Because that, land, that landed in the water, right? Those are the water, yeah, the permanently the affixed pontoons. water landers. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. This is so, so. This is all the different uh, airplanes, I guess. Right. Yeah. So some of the stats on this thing, uh, they, Microsoft. This is another thing Microsoft does great. So when you're worried about Microsoft owning games, right? We've seen this across. You know, the Gears of War titles, that Sea of Thieves game is like this. They update it and update it and update it. And so in two years, Microsoft has released 27 content updates, all free. So if you own this game, if you bought it outright, or if you access it through Xbox Game Pass or play it on Xbox Cloud Gaming, whatever it is, you got everything for free, right? There was a helicopter and glider thing from last month, uh, the 40th anniversary. Um, yeah, so 10, was it, what did I say? <laughs> What was the number? 10 million players. Um, 500 million flights of 40 billion total miles flown. That's the equivalent of 10 million trips around the earth. Um, I had a travel year that was like that. I remember that. And the equivalent of 200 round trips uh, from the earth to the sun. <laughs> oh, wow. Which was a question I got in a test I took recently. It said, yeah, how, many how many miles round is trips? it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, how many miles was it from the earth to the sun? And I was like, 93 million. No, no. The question was, how many minutes does it take for light to travel from Seven the sun? Seven and a half minutes. Is that right? I did not know that. I was like, 93 million. No, wait. That's the distance. <laughs> I didn't know it was 93 million. See, between the two of us, it's, we do okay. I think it's 90, yeah, 93 million miles, I believe. That was what came out of my mouth. And then I was like, wait, no, that's just... Well, you just uh, divide yeah, that by 365,000. Yeah. It's uh, surprisingly, Leo, I couldn't do that on the top of my head. 300,000 <laughs> kilometers per second yeah. divided by 93. Oh, never mind. By the way... Speaking yeah. of numbers, and mm -hmm. I should have known this because we were in Pearl about a year ago, a little oh, more than boy. a year ago. It's the right. 80th was last year because there okay. was a big 80th okay. thing. Yeah, it was on. 41. You were correct. Yep, yeah. Sorry about that. And No, I said 42. I wasn't sure. I, uh, If you've not done that, by the way, an incredible yeah, experience haven't. to see the memorial the oh, where the Missouri cool. was sunk um, right. and, and, and get on those ships. I just it's saw just uh, You sort of don't appreciate it. Um, you know, when I've seen pictures, I've not been, but I mean, I just saw a beautiful photo of it from above where you can really see the, it was the, the water was perfectly clear and it was just a, a kind of a stunning photo yeah. of the stuff that's under the water, yeah, right? the, which is the Missouri crazy. is under the water. So yeah. they built the memorial over it, like out to over the top of it, over yeah. it. And so if you look over the side of the memorial, you can see mm -hmm. parts of the ship is still coming up. And in fact, oil is still leaking from oh, it. But. So there's a little oil slick. Uh, well, and then the memorial itself is is terrifically moving because, of course, sure. uh, it you're standing above the graves of many sailors who died with the ship and were and were interred yeah. with the ship. And then there's also a list of men who were on the Missouri, survived, mm -hmm. and in their last wishes said, oh, "But when I die, please bury me there." So right. they actually. Uh, How and does I that think, work? Is it a Ashes thing. Uh, that's a good question. There is a um, a, a, hole, a part hole that you could. That apparently they bring, oh. they bring it. It probably has got to be ashes, right? And they bring it there, I and they, so. I can't imagine and they, they, and they drop it. Like, but, but it was very moving yeah. because the thought was, well, right. you know, these guys survived. Their comrades yeah. died, but yeah. they are so moved and touched by that sacrifice. They say, and and some of them were buried like five, ten years ago. I think it slowed down a lot. But oh, yeah. uh, some of them uh, were like 2006. I, I took a picture of it. It was incredible. So there's a list of the people who have been buried there since, you know, dying of natural causes. 
um, mm. to be with their comrades. And I just, wow. Right. It's a beautiful place yeah. uh, and a beautiful memorial and lots of history. And just, I really, uh, you know, it's, it is something we should remember. 81 years ago. Right. It's quite a shock. Hmm. Quite a shock. It takes eight and one third minutes for light to get from the sun. As anyone would know who could divide 93 million by 186,000 yeah. sure. miles per second. It's the Arizona, not the Missouri. That's right. The Missouri is the one you visit. The Arizona mm -hmm. is the one that sank in that you're, uh, the, uh, thank you for correcting me on that. I'm just full of misinformation today. Maybe you better do this show uh, without me. I'll just uh, I'll just sit I, over honestly, here in the I, corner. I, I, if you want misinformation, I'm your guy. All right, so <laughs> Game Pass uh, titles for December. Yeah, there's some good ones too, and some more day and date type stuff. So there's the um, uh, the hello. What do you call it? Lego Star Wars? The so Skywalker Saga. That's supposed that to be pretty good. good. Yeah, those are supposed to be good. Um, the Walking Dead, the final season. So this is the former Telltale Games. Remember that company? Yeah. Uh, which I think I these are like stories, backwards. story yeah. games. So yeah. I I have played through most of the games in this series, and I I don't believe I played the final season. So I'm going to take a look at that. Um, Hello Neighbor Two, which is kind of a crazy looking game. I've not played, but looks very interesting. Or not the original either. Uh, and then a Hot Wheels um, Unleashed game that looks pretty good, too. So a bunch of stuff. Whenever I um, see these these pictures of games, mostly I've never heard of. Yeah. Well, but these, I mean, uh, th this is maybe half and half, yeah. <laughs> at least, you know. Um, this is but they're all, they're all, the covers are all very colorful and exciting and make you, you know. Yeah. I don't know what Metal Helsinger is, but boy, that looks mm -hmm. like fun. But look at that cover. Yeah. Why is there a cover? I'm just going to download it, <laughs> you know. Well, it reminds me when I was younger and had an Atari, mm -hmm. I was always looking for games to play. Right. I used yeah, to go to a game go store that was dusty and they had stuff, you know, kind of in stacks and falling over and stuff. And you'd look at a game and you go, I have no idea if this is a good game. <laughs> I used to, uh, <coughs> my, I had an Amiga and my favorite game company was Cygnosis. Which Cygnosis, was by yeah. Sony. And that had that weird, um, the Psygnosis had yeah. that weird LSD psychedelic mushroom. Well, no, so it was like, it was, was the guy who did the Yes album art. Uh, it was, it was yeah. Alan, Alan yeah. Dean? No. Um, it looked like Dean? a Yes cover. Yeah. Yeah. What was that guy's name? Alan Dean? Alan Dean? Whatever his name was. It was the same I guy. I think it was so Joey it, Bishop, as I remember. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Joey Ramone. I don't know. It was one of those guys. Um, I am going to look it up. I am going to it's look it up. De it's something Dean. It's some or Dean. Who something. did the artwork for Yes album covers? Roger Dean. Yes, Roger of course. Dean. Thank you. Jeez, okay. And he did. Sorry. So I did not know he did the Cygnosis. Yes, uh, logo. not all of them, but a lot of them. It and looked just like not just those. the logo, but the every game had a unique logo and a box art that was gorgeous, right? And at least on um, the Amiga, at least the games. You know, like you talk about Atari. Like you buy a game that looks like that thing. And you bring it home, and it's like 16 pixels by 8 pixels or whatever. But when you brought home, a, like, an Amiga game, like, um, you know, Shadow of the Beast especially, um, I mean, those games were amazing and uh, graphically and uh, kind of lived up. To, you know, they weren't quite as good as the uh, the box art, obviously, but they really looked up to it. Well, that's or the problem I had, because I'd get these games home, and they'd be <laughs> horrible. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, and, right, and you know, the box art was always gorgeous. Yeah, um, there you go. That looks, that's a, that right there is a... A yes album cover, but, yeah. with, but it's for a game. You know, it's a game called Super Black Onyx that I never heard of. Oh, uh, some of my favorite games were from these guys. I, Psygnosis was good. I, I yeah, for this stuff. Yeah, they got bought by Sony, and they released a version of Shadow of the Beast on some version of the PlayStation at one point, and it kind of just disappeared. I don't know what happened. Oh, look at Barbarian. Yeah, it's a good one. yeah, I love Roger Dean. Let's give him some credit. Roger Dean, yeah. Roger Dean yep. and Cygnosis, which had that great... That was, you know, that was smart of them. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I On our last cruise, I met a uh, guy who did um, game covers on the boxes. He was the artist who painted yeah. them. He was a painter. Oh, I mean, his paint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if it was Roger Dean and I just didn't know it. Oh, boy. That I would feel like bad. he... Has he passed away? Oh, I'm sure. I feel like he might yeah. have recently passed away. Yeah. Here's Shadow of the Beast. Yeah. Let me show you this one. If I push the right button, there you go. Yeah. Bring back memories, huh? huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I, right, that landscape right there was the same landscape that Yes used for their Union album cover. It's the same fake planet. <laughs> you know, it's like the same. 
I, if you're going to have, if Music band. Night is going to feature the songs of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, Billy Squire oh. and Yes, John Anderson, I will be I will be there. Billy Squire? No, I don't know. No, Chris Squire. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Squire. What are you talking about? I was about? up late last night. Don't bug me, man. I said Alan Dean. What am I talking? Mean, you know, of course, this is the, the the quintessential way that men interact. Like I make fun of you for something, I make the same mistake, and then I make fun of you for making it. You know? I don't know why. I just, I'm sorry. I just go right there. That's no, not, no, you're just, right. I'm, so, I'm, I'm telling like, are you, you, are you stupid? Are you, what Billy the hell? Squire? You're crazy, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Billy Squire oh, was, uh, you know, another guy. Stroke, right? He was. Yeah, the, stroke. Um, Stroke. Lonely as the night. Lonely as the Lonely. night. Boy, you're good. Wow. Yeah, he was good. Yep. He you are really good. very good. And then uh, was, and uh, Chris Squire was, was he the, the bassist? bassist from, yeah, the bassist. Was the bassist. John Anderson. Yeah. But Squire did the singing too, right? Was he the high voice guy? Uh, he didn't sing too many of the songs. Oh, okay. he, did, um, he did background mostly. He had Run With The Fox. He did. Um, I didn't know you yeah. were a yes aficionado. Oh, yes. I yes. love yes. I thought that was my guilty secret. <clears throat> oh, no. This no one I know I first, likes um, Yes, but I grew up, I mean, that was my, we played that uh, Yes songs over and over in college oh, without, yeah. without yeah, of course. let up. Yep. Close no, to like the it. edge. Quite a bit. I've seen Yes many times. Have you? Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah, sorry, Anderson Bruce for Wakeman Howe. I've seen Rick John Wakeman Anderson, was, myself. of course, the keyboardist yeah. of the Six Wise of Henry the Eighth. Yeah. Oof. That's right. Wild. That's great. Many people, the chat room's making me feel better. Many people mm -hmm. like Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, well, well pe people. Leo. people. I don't know. Nobody I know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what you mean by that. But. People. All right. Uh, is there any more in this fabulous Xbox oh. segment of which we speak? No. There is one more thing. Uh, this is only. This is not Xbox specific, but gaming related. Um, Amazon has a service called Luna, which is their game streaming service. Um, they used to offer. They offer. So they have a kind of a, a base price for it. They have different, um, I don't know what they call it, channels or something where you can kind of buy add-ons and you could pay, you could pay over 20 bucks a month for this thing if you wanted to. If you want like and they, 4K and all that, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, and different like content too. So they used to offer an $18 per month Ubisoft Plus channel that allowed you to access all the latest, actually, I'm sorry, they probably still offer this, but this was the only way you could get Ubisoft games through Luna. But now if you own Ubisoft games, on PC, you can stream them through Luna for free. So it's a little bit like uh, GeForce Now in that capacity, I guess I'll call it. Um, so there's some kind of a deal with Ubisoft, which is good. It's so hysterical because be they have Luna Plus, they have Prime yeah, Gaming, they have Ubisoft Plus, they have Jackbox yeah. Games, they have all yep. these crazy little... And I think there are five or six of them and yeah. you could, you know, Prime members get, you know, two bucks off the base price and blah, 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 whatever. So it, it's, there's a lot of stuff there, but... And it's only U.S. only, so if you're watching from Europe or wherever, sorry, but um, I'm sure they'll get there eventually. I think I bought the Luna controller. I can't remember. I did. That. I absolutely <laughs> bought the. I, speaking of which, I just got my refund on the Stadia controller. Um, yeah, they're coming out. Yeah, that's finally happening. So that was good. That was sixty bucks. I think I paid for that thing, or fifty bucks. I don't remember. I did buy two games like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Me too. <laughs> No. Such a moron. And it's silly because you and I both had, at the time, I had xCloud Gaming as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, how many different, it's well, like I, three well, music I, services, four gaming services, what the hell? That's why you need played, Rocket played, Money, our sponsor. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Figure yeah, out what recurring. you're paying for. That's right. Anyway. Xbox Game Pass included you, Ubisoft, right? That's what somebody's been saying in the chat room, how to sing. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm not sure, is that true? Hmm. I'm not sure about that. Out of sync says so. Okay. Well, and he's hungry like a wolf. There you go. Nice. Speaking of the 80s. <laughs> oh, man. We'll do a special oh. show just on album tracks. I think we should have, uh, you know, they have Music Night at Throts. I think we should mm -hmm. have Music Night at Windows mm -hmm. Weekly. Actually, we are going to have Music Night later tonight. Oh, so, so we're going to. We're getting there. What are you no, doing I mean, tonight? Uh, on, no, no. I mean, on the show, we're going to talk about music. Oh, Oh, yeah. is this going to be your new pick of the week thing? It's not going to be a new thing, but it's the end of the year. So I've been getting those like end of year recaps from services and stuff. Yeah. So I thought I'd just kind of go through that a little bit. It's kind of interesting. Speaking of end of the year, I should mention that you will be mm -hmm. part of our uh, oh, yeah. season ending twit, which will be, uh, I think that's New Year's 15th. Day. That might be a, when is that? We're going to record on the 15th. Don't forget. 
Yeah. A week from right, tomorrow. Right. So it's a week from tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because that, because uh, it's going to be, we decided to do, uh, we did this once before and I loved it. Kind mm -hmm. of the, the long time, the long haulers. Uh, long, so, <laughs> long haulers. The, the, the COVID long haulers. The COVID long the haulers. Middle. They're all be going, <laughs> well, and then, yeah. no, Therat. Gibson's mm -hmm. going to be there. Yep, nice, nice. Uh, Jarvis is going to be yep. there. And we're adding a new member of the team because he's old, just like me. <laughs> I was going to uh, say. Doc like... Searles will be there as well. Okay. So that's going to be this great. This is going to be one of the rare groups where I lower the average age. You are the youngest person in the group. <laughs> by far. That's crazy. I like, never get to do that I, anymore. I, the, uh, if it weren't for you, I could make the cutoff 60 and up. But we thought we'd have, we kind of get one of the younger people sure. in so that Thank we you. balance the panel. <laughs> Paul, what's his Snapchat I hear all about? <laughs> Do you young people use TikTok? Is that, is that? <laughs> when I use Telegram, it's an app, not a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, so we did the Luna story. Uh, oh, I really want to do. The back yeah. of the book, there's some really good stuff. This is your picks. Uh, and that's, by the way, what we'll do on that um, special. So the way we do this for all of our shows, uh, we have a best of. So there'll be a best of Windows Weekly. Our last Windows Weekly of the year will be the 21st. Uh, of course, Christmas is that weekend. And so we start our best ofs that weekend. And all the week okay. of the uh, 26th through the 30th will be best ofs. So best of Windows Weekly. Right, and then we'll be about you and I'll be back January fourth, uh, okay. with all new shows for the new year. But right. uh, as we usually do with Twit, we do a, a best of, and that'll be on Christmas, so no one will listen to it. <laughs> and, and then uh, the following week, which is New Year's Day, we're going to have uh, this special holiday episode, and it will be a look back at twenty twenty two. So we'll pick yep. uh, the ten big stories from 2022 to talk about that kind of thing. There'll, there'll be a there'll be a list for you. You can, but Paul's going to do okay. his look back on podcasts, yep. books, and music in just a moment. Right. I'm very excited. Right. But first, a word, if I can, if I may, about <laughs> Melissa. Windows Weekly is brought to you by M E L I S S A. What is Melissa? It is the best way to make sure your customer contact data is up to date. But that's, the, even to say that, it's such a small part of what Melissa does. In fact, they have now put out the their 2023 Melissa Solutions Catalog. Imagine being a company with so many services and features that you could put out a catalog of just the things Melissa does. A leading provider of global data quality. They do identity, identity verification now. And of course, the address management solutions. So you can look in the solutions catalog to find things that uh, support data quality, enrichment, identity verification that powers your business's compliance, fraud prevention, sales, customer engagement, analytics. It's all in there. Originally developed as a uh, industry resource for database administrators and developers, uh, the catalog has all the tools that you would need to clean, to verify, to update, to dedupe and even to add to your customer contact data. It's so important in any business to keep track of your customers, right? Your contact data. Actually, in some businesses, the customers might be suppliers as well, right? Uh, that's how, those are the people that are important to the success of your business. But what we forget is that data is going bad all the time. People move, names change, phone numbers change, emails change even faster. Melissa can reverse that decay and they can do it any way you want at any point in the data chain. They have an API so you can do it at the point of entry. So in your, in your sales system, uh, your shopping cart, uh, your customer service uh, software, Melissa can actually be integrated in through the API. People start typing an address. You've seen this probably before and it goes, oh, you mean, and it fills it out. Or you type an email and they say, no, 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 that, that, that's, not a, that's not a legal email address. That's Melissa. All your global people data will be up to date, not just email, addresses, names, phones, validated, updated, standardized. You can do this on-prem. You can do it as a web service. They have SaaS delivery. They have a secure, this is kind of old-fashioned, but you know what? Some, for some people, this is perfect. This is what I use. They have a secure FTP site, so you can upload 
our Christmas card list is what we do. Upload it and then download it. Fresh, clean it up to date with accurate addresses, accurate emails. It's awesome. Melissa, again recognized by Gartner in the 2022 Magic Quadrant for data quality solutions. Here's a quote from Mr. Melissa. Speak of the devil, Ray Melissa, president and founder of Melissa. He says, quote, we believe Melissa's recognition in the Magic Quadrant for data quality solutions, and this is the third year running, highlights our razor sharp focus on helping our customers make the most of their customer data. We have made extensive advancements in the area of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and metadata processing. We've added knowledge graphs, drag and drop, no code, low code functionality, data quality automation to our product stack. The result is a comprehensive tool set for data quality, address verification, and identity verification. With our tools and services, businesses are empowered to meet complex regulations, streamline onboarding, combat fraud, and, and realize the true value of customer data as a business asset. Boy, that's, he said it perfectly. What's cool is they're now using the latest cutting-edge technologies like machine learning. They've been around since 1985. They've, they've kind of pioneered this whole idea of global intelligence solutions to help organizations unlock accurate data for a more compelling customer view. Melissa. And by the way, your data is safe with Melissa. They undergo independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data and security and privacy and compliance. They are GDPR compliant, SOC 2, HIPAA. Your data is in absolutely the best hands. Bottom line, make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Get started today. 1,000 records cleaned for free. Just to give you an idea of how it works at Melissa.com slash twit. M-E-L-I-S-S-A, Melissa dot com slash twit want to thank ray and uh his team at melissa they're great people greg uh for your support so long uh on this show and all our shows we really appreciate it uh great product great service and really really good people melissa.com slash twit thank you by the way for supporting us by dear listener and viewer by going to that address that way they know you saw it here melissa.com slash twit now with Paul, we are going yes. to end the year. I like mm -hmm. doing this. I, I think you should do this every week. No, you can't. You couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's this week's playlist. <laughs> um. <laughs> this is really a good idea, though. I like it. Yeah. So, well, you know, everyone's getting these year-end recaps, right? Spotify came out with it. Everyone's talking, you know, Apple Music. Did. I'm happy to say that use... your show is often, people have been saying on tooting on the Mastodon, look at my number yeah, one show, it. Windows Weekly. Right. Someone told me last week that the longest podcast episode they listened to this year was the last episode of Windows Weekly, yeah. which was yep. two hours and 46 minutes long or some crazy thing. Um, yeah, so I I mean, I get these things too, right? So I, I when when I think about podcasts, um, books, and mostly, well, uh, mostly audiobooks, although uh, there were some good Kindle books as well this year, and um, <clears throat> music. You know, I, I'm I'm... I'm kind of in a different space than I used to be when I was younger, I guess. And um, for a long time, for example, I didn't really listen to tech podcasts. Um, one of the changes I made, not this past year, but the year before, was I added a bunch of tech podcasts, right? So uh, things like .NET Rocks with Richard Campbell and um, Run His Radio, also with Richard Campbell. Um, Talks at Google, right? And then there's a new one that uh, just debuted from Google at the begin, at, right when they launched the Pixel 7 and those other products called Made by Google. And they did a run of eight episodes where they talked to people inside of Google about particular products. So they talked about uh, a guy, but you know, about the Tensor uh, chipset. They talked to someone about their audio oh, work. They talked to somebody. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's actually, I, I found it very informative, but my number one podcast of last year, and I mean like by far, it's possible that I listened to this more than everything else combined is something called maintenance phase. And this is, I think of it as a wellness and weight loss kind of a podcast. It's a, I don't know, I just say this, like, it's a, it's a, it's a fat woman and a gay guy and they are hilarious and super in, informative, which is what I like. And they debunk things related to weight loss and, and whatever. Um, I listened to this thing for 22 hours and 46 minutes this year. Wow. Um, uh, 26 episodes. Um, this is the one podcast I just listen straight <clears throat> through every single thing they ever do. I went back to listen to all the ones I've never listened I'm, to. I'm, I'm opening up my pocket cast right now. 
and going to add this. Yeah, it's very interesting. But I'll just say this. There's one that might even be more interesting to people because it's more kind of general knowledge type stuff. The, 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 the guy of Maintenance Phase, Michael Hobbs, created another podcast recently with someone named Peter uh, Sham Shiri, who was a lawyer, called If Books Could Kill. And what that podcast, <laughs> it's a great name. What that podcast does it, is it takes on, it does the same sort of debunking, but for what they call like airport books, which are dangerous books that have bad ideas that lots of people bought and thought were they were right. So the classic example of this is Freakonomics which is 100% yes. yes. nonsense. Yes. Isn't that 100 hysterical? Nonsense. But you love yeah. it because it's like, oh, yeah. that makes sense. Oh, Here's wow. Here's why I love it. I actually, so listen, I'm, I am I am not in any way egotistical, which is, which I've just said, so obviously I'm egotistical. But I mean, like, but the one thing I, I'm sort of like, I don't know, semi-proud of is I, I like to think that I look at things differently than a lot of other people do. And I like to have a, a, a discussion with someone where they're like, no, you're wrong. And it's like, well, hold on, let's talk about this. And they're like, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. And I feel like Freakonomics is that, where they're like, hey, uh, you thought crime went down in the 90s because they added more cops, but would you believe it was this other thing? I'm like, oh my God, that blew my mind. And it's nonsense. It's so, all, that was the, the, the broken window is, theory, which has been proven wrong. It's all completely again and wrong. Again. Yeah. yeah. Right. So they actually recorded eight episodes or seven or eight episodes, and then they recorded the one for Freakonomics. And they were like, we got to put this one out first because it's, it's, Perfect. And now they've, there's only three or four episodes so far, but that are out, you know, public, but um, it's like I said, it's one of the co-hosts for maintenance phase, which I love uh, this guy's and the two of them are, they're so smart. And the way they present this is one guy, one of the two hosts, and this is true of both podcasts is, has completely researched the topic, read the book, whatever it is. The other one's just coming in fresh. Oh, I and like so podcasts kind of like that. The, That's a common no, format. I love that. For you, for someone to, and you're good at that. This is like what you're like, actually. I just pretend um, to be a, a bimbo. No, no, no. For someone, <laughs> for someone to be presented with something for the first time and then be able to speak intelligently about it is a gift. And these guys, the two that's, of them. That's uh, the, awesome. It's awesome. So that's, that, that. that was that was kind yeah. of my year in podcasts. By the so, way, Corey Doctorow um, calls, and he, he, I'm sure he didn't invent it, but he calls, yep. uh, uh, it might have actually been David Grabner in his The Dawn of Everything, but he calls Freakonomics, um, Malcolm Gladwell. Yep, Malcolm Gladwell episode two. He calls them just, <laughs> yep. just so stories, which yeah. like Kipling's just so stories are completely false, but sound right. so right. That you just so, go, oh yeah, that's it. I just so I just did something like this on the show earlier. I said to you, and I I don't have a name for it, so I think of it as a. It's like that does not mean this kind of thing, like, right? Which is so. In other words, I said to you, Microsoft is releasing this thing for Teams for consumers because te in my brain Teams has slowed, and this is a way to get Teams up, and that's absolutely not how it happened. They there was there's no way these things are connected because it's impossible, but I've drawn this connection in my brain. And at least I recognize that I'm doing it. Like I know it's not right, <laughs> but that's, it's that kind of thing. It's like, um, it's uh, Gilligan's Island. The best example I can think of this is one day the skipper walks up to Gilligan. Gilligan's got a garlic uh, necklace around his neck. And he's like, what are you, what, why are you wearing garlic? And he goes, Oh, this keeps the crocodiles away. He's like, Gilligan, there were no crocodiles on this Island. He's like, see, it works. <laughs> you know, like it's see, I it, proved it's it. It's 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 just, it's nonsense. But that's you know. Anyway, I like things that debunk things that are smart. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, not, those two not, podcasts, not Gilligan, they, but okay. No, no I'm no, subscribing. But, but, I just put them in my pocket. Uh, th th those are smart. Those are where smart. they will sit for weeks and never get listened to because who has time? But well, okay. But that's the thing with podcasts. So I I just said with maintenance phase, that's the one that I I blow through, and I'm going to really do that good. with if yeah. books could kill. Yeah. The other podcasts I listen to are just kind of all over the map, and I cherry pick things. So for example, I don't listen to every episode of .NET Rocks, but when they have people on that I really like, for example, I know the latest episode is Billy Hollis. He is this guy uh, talks a lot about UX design a lot. He's got kind of a funny accent. He's he's I've never met him, but he sounds really cool. But he his episode with these guys a year ago was my favorite episode of that entire year. So I'm, I'm going to be listening to that very soon. So I, I, a lot of these things I subscribe, but I'm really just kind of cherry picking. It's like, just um, nice to have them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like yeah. American history tellers will have a great series about Watergate or something. I'm like, yeah, I will listen to that whole thing. And then maybe I'll skip the next topic. You know, it depends. So People, I, that, that's, people that's often that's ask me if I listen to our shows and I said, well, no, I don't. I was there. <laughs> I don't right. really, I don't right. really need exactly. to listen. 
uh, mm -mm. to them. I don't even listen to other hosts' shows. I probably should. I just well, there's just on. not enough time. You, you, I, no, come on. Come in on. fact, mostly yeah. I listen to audiobooks. I just um, yes, I just started the Expanse series. I know everybody yells at me when I say that because people have been telling right. me, "Oh, you gotta, you gotta." read the books and, and watch the show. And I, we watched the show. It was okay. It was a little claustrophobic, but I didn't expect mm -hmm. much from the books. And, the, and the, I read the first one and I just finished Leviathan Wakes. It's incredible. It's right. incredible. And when I say read, just like you, audio book. But that's like so a 20-hour audio book, so I don't have time I for tell podcasts. You, I, my audio books out, um, performed my uh, Kindle books last year by... Yeah, like five, five to one. Because you can listen when you're doing. You know, I listen when I'm gaming. I bet you drive don't, to the gym while I'm at the gym. Yep. Drive home from yep. the gym. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, yep. I just you know you kind of do it yep. that way. If you yep. ever drive to the airport, that's longer, whatever. So this is this was a good year for industry books. Um, two of my top five books of the year were industry books. Control Freak. We talked about this. This was Cliff Blazinski, Cliffy B, right? His epic adventures making video games. He was responsible for the Gears of War, but he played a big role. In Unreal, on my list, and all that you've been talking about. Fascinating. Can't that was wait a great to read one. That. Yep. The other awesome one, which I assume you have read, is After Steve: How Apple Became a Trillion Dollar Company. And yes, lost that's actually the best Steve Jobs book, I think. I couldn't agree more. I, it's a fantastic book, and um, I, that's one. I, I uh, Steve Jobs' uh, biography, the official biography, the Isaac. There are book. chapters of yeah. that book that yeah. I listen to on audiobook again and again and again. I, iPhone. I've had uh, you know a couple of those things. I don't care about the his he was a kid that stuff but yeah. there's parts of that I listen to again and again. Um, I will I'm going to listen to this book again soon. This was a really good one. No, Trip Mickle uh, and his and uh, was it Mickles? I can't remember his uh, co-author were at the uh, uh, they were tech reporters. I, I want to say at Seattle. The Wall Street Journal. I thought or it was the Journal. Uh, that's what it was. I think it was. I think oh, it was you're Wall talking about Trip Mickelson's book? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a different. That's not after Steve, or is it? Yeah, it, it is. is after Steve. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe you're talking Steve. about a different book. I'm sorry. I was talk I was talking about becoming Steve Jobs. Have you uh, read yes, that? I'm sorry. Yes, of course. That's yep. the best Steve yeah, Jobs biography. Just, uh, after Steve is really I, I not about yeah. Steve Jobs as much. No, but that's why I thought you were yeah. saying that because in a way, what what it shows is like what he did for Apple because when he's gone, yeah, what's missing? Yeah, you know, I, yeah. there's a the, no. I mean, it's it's very interesting. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic book. Yeah, um, I was thinking I also, of becoming Steve Jobs by Brett Schlender. And Rick okay. Tetzelli, and they, I think, were at the Seattle Business. Times. Oh, they, they it was a newspaper. Okay, I'm sorry. I think so, but I may be. I mean, I was going to say, business I am the king of misinformation today. You should believe nothing yep. I have sure. said. Well, it's okay. I'm going to correct you with something that's wrong, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nope, you're right. Brett Schlender was at the um, Wall Street Journal and Fortune. Rick Tetzelli yeah. was at Fast Company. You, yep. Uh, but I'm an okay. idiot. No, I'm an still, idiot. Still wrong. No, that's what I'm, I'm an idiot. But uh, yes, but After Steve was very interesting. <laughs> and we did interview Trip. And yeah, that's a very interesting uh, book. I you know, thought. when you speak off the cuff, this is what's going to happen, right? People come back later and be like, you know, on November 18th, you said that. I'm like, speaking oh, I, off the floor. I mean, I, say I am lots just of stuff. Not, I don't yeah. you know. I'm sorry. My head is in the perfect. soup today. So, yeah. Um, one other book has nothing to do with the industry, but, I, and I'm not, I am not, I don't care about celebrities. I don't, I'm not into this kind of thing, but I do read memoirs from time to time, depending on who it is. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Well, the one that came out this year recently was, uh, Jan Wenner, the guy who, who uh, founded Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone magazine. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. And by the way, um, I started listening to it and I was like, I, the, the narrator, I'm like, I, this is, I know this guy. And he narrated the autobiography of, um, Ray Manzarek, the guy who played. Oh, yeah, from the Doors. Or, yeah, yeah, uh, keyboard the, guard, the Doors. The guy played. Yeah, so Set the Night on Fire, he narrated that book. So here's these two great books that kind of start in the 60s. Same, you know, same guy, and it has that kind of vibe. It's neat. Um, so that was kind of cool. And I, I, there's other stuff, I, you know, Project Hail Mary, Devil in a White City, which is not new, that are fine. Um, as far as books go, this one's, I think you just mentioned Cory Doctor, all right? I yeah. Think he just did. Yeah. So he he has a book he co-authored with Rebecca Giblin called Checkpoint Capitalism. Incredible. Yeah. And I honestly, I bought that on Kindle. That one's really good. And that's one, I, I think particular chapters are super important, um, which I found to be very, so so very interesting. Yeah, we did a um, triangulation, the three of us. Uh, highly okay. recommend that book. And that, by the way, really rakes Apple over the coals. I mean, it it, it is exactly yeah. Yeah. what you were talking about. Um, right. And it's very powerful and very compelling, and I think yep. Corey's absolutely right. Choke point yeah. capitalism. I'm really, I'm glad you read that. That's a fantastic book. 
Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I recommend it. Um, I also just just I actually wrote an article about this because I, I, um, I, one of the things that strikes me as I get older is that a lot of the things I liked when I was younger don't really hold up, and that could be you know it could be music, it could be movies, it could be TV shows, whatever. Um, the first Stephen King book I ever read, I was babysitting for family in 1982. The father of that family had left the paperback sitting out. I, by that point, had read all of Tolkien, the, you know, C.S. Lewis, Asimov, Pornell, Niven, all kinds of fantasy as well, the Sword of Shannara, et cetera, et cetera. Never read anything by Stephen King. And now, uh, 40 <laughs> whatever years all. later, yeah. I have read it all, basically. <laughs> yeah, There's yeah. only like one or two I have not completed um, but there are books of his that I read or listen to again and again. And, um, this is one of them and it, it's a collection of short stories. It's astonishing to me how well this holds up. And the thing I remember most about it is I would read it on a couch in front of a big window, beautiful summer days, you know, and I'd read some of it and I'd have to put the book down and go find the kids and make, you know, I'm like, I just want to make sure you're okay. And I'm like, I just want to make sure I'm okay. Like it actually scared me and, um, I'm reading it. You know, I read it sometimes. I'll, you know, we go to bed, I read it. And I'm sitting there in the dark and I'm like, did something just move in the corner of the room or is it, you know, like it's, it's, it's still scary. It's amazing. Like he's amazing. He's just an amazing author. So, um, wait, anyway. before you go on. Yes. How do you feel about the gunslinger? Oh, see, uh, this is where I kind of fall off the map a little Me bit. Too. The, the, yeah. the first book was the first book of that series, the dark tower. No, the gunslinger yeah. is the first one, yeah. right? Yeah. So the first book is. Very much like the first book of the Foundation Trilogy. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of stories that were written over time um, that they put together into a single volume, and it, it tells a story. But it's not, it's not one story. It's kind of just a collection of stories. And I, th I thought that book was very good. I liked it quite a bit. The second book um, I also liked, and then they – it's kind of like the Game of Thrones book. You're like, oh, this is great. I, I I look forward to more of these. And then more come out and you're like, I don't know. Eventually there's like a, 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 a robot bear and they're on a monorail. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm reading anymore. Like I don't. And people, when I, when I complain about it, people always say, oh, no, no, no. You have to, you got to get through it because the ending is amazing. And I'm like, I don't, I don't care. It <laughs> seems kind of endless. Yeah. Yeah. Both Lisa well, and yeah, I go, God, it's just, it's a kind of running joke. It's another gunslinger. <laughs> yeah, there you go. An, endless, yeah, yeah. an endless series of books that yeah. never make yeah. any progress. <laughs> that one didn't do it for me. No, I, me um, neither. It, it, it is a book that I loved in the 80s when it came out. The first ones were great. It now, but that's why it's I, disappointing. You know, it's, yeah, it just kind of petered out. Yeah, it didn't do it for me. No. So. Okay. All right, moving along. That's book. So I didn't write about this, but I also just got my, you, you know, you referenced Music Night. And so I just say like the, um, the origin of this is that, you know, when I was younger and I used to drive more, I think we used to, we, I was just talking to my wife about this. Things used to take a lot longer, right? So we mentioned, I mentioned Blockbuster Video. Like if you want to watch a movie tonight, you sit on your couch with a remote and you dick around for 45 minutes until you find something, but you have a, a selection of a million choices. The whole world is anything you want is there. But back in the day, we used to actually get in our cars and drive 10 to 30 minutes, depending on where the place was, get out of our cars, mm. look through a video store, find a thing, <laughs> walk up to the front, find out it wasn't there, go back and find something oh else. Oh, my God. Drive home. Uh. This is a very purposeful time, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so in those days, I used to make like, I, I think of them, I used to make like mixtapes or mix CDs for myself. I didn't like the radio. I didn't like talking. And I would listen to music. And that's what I used to do. And by the time we got older and had been working from home for a long time, we got our first couple of Sonos speakers. I would often play music just kind of for myself. And like if my wife went out with her friends, I would be, I would just sit there and, and uh, kind of add music to a playlist on the fly. I would just make these playlists. My friends do this. We have get togethers. We, some, someone will provide the music, you know, that kind of thing. And um, at some point, right before we moved here, my wife said, I'd like to do this. We should do this some night, you know, with we'll listen to music. And I was like, oh, that's not good. Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't really listen to music that you might want to listen to, you know. So it, it caused me to adapt. these. And so now we have several years of playlists that I've made where I'm trying to find music that both of us like. And so in the beginning, I had a um, kind of a, what do I call this? A, a beat, is that the right word? A requirement. Like if you ever see, like when you see a group live, they play a song. It's a little sped up, right? Yeah. Or words, sometimes it's slow down, and then I hate that. 
No, but oftentimes it's it's sped up, and yeah. I like that. So yeah. I've often, I for whatever too. reason, more energy. Yeah. I've often liked live music better right. than the right. original version. So that kind of thing. So in the beginning, I was like, we're gonna, I'm gonna find music that meets this requirement. They, this is gonna be mostly fast moving. Although I've lightened up on that over the years, um, but that was the start of it. And so I also wanted to find music that she would like, right? So um, more music, uh, like women artists that I wouldn't typically listen to, or. Um, I don't know what else. This stuff like that. This stuff I wouldn't normally listen to. The interesting thing is I, like, I found my like I've gotten into Taylor Swift, which is really weird because I'm kind of a, like a Van Halen, Def Leppard guy, and <laughs> that um, is weird. So, you are. And then of course the the past two years we've been going to Mexico, so we actually now have a lot of like Latino music as well. Yeah. So sure. it was interesting to me to get my um, YouTube music end of year thing right. So first of all, I don't know. I don't know if they're count. I, I, I usually play through Sonos when I'm on Sonos. So I don't know if they know that that's me or whatever, but I, I've apparently played 2,600 minutes of music. Which doesn't sound like that much. I know. That's why I said that. I'm not sure. I think sure. they're not counting at all. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. 2,600. So Def Leppard was number one, <laughs> right? I am in the top 3% of Def Leppard fans on YouTube music. <laughs> Um, That's it's hysterical. just kind of interesting. That's so funny. Yeah. So Taylor Swift was number two. There's a group called Mana that was number um Three, they're a, I believe they're from Mexico, but they're Latino either way. Um, their big song is like, it's called En El Moye de San Blas. It's like the, on the pier or dock in San Blas. It's basically one of those, I'm holding a candle for someone who went away and may Aww. not come back kind of things. But there's a live version of that song, which is awesome. And I love acquiring new music for playlists. And the way that I do that is... I could be at a friend's house and they're playing music. I'm like, oh, what's this? You know, I can find out what the song is. I add it to my own playlist. Um, we've been going to Mexico. So when we go to restaurants and bars and and they'll play music over the thing, I'll Shazam it or whatever. And I found this song um, at our favorite restaurant in our area. And it's it was my, our num my, my number four song of the year. <laughs> so wow. And my number three song, right? Um, she had, which is a, in a New Zealand band. And, um, and then number five was Sting. That's not right. <laughs> I did not listen to Sting a lot this year, but oh, that's they, maybe that, you did, and you just didn't know. Mm, no, mm. I didn't. Mm. Anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. So it's kind of an interesting mix of my past. <laughs> you know, She Hot is a kind of a metal hard rock band. Um, the music that I listen to with my wife, which is a little more uh, diverse, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, actually, my top genres are rock, right? Pop, obviously, independent, Latino pop and then dance so it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting mix i was curious about this i thought this was kind of interesting and i oh i should say i have a like everyone else does you get a playlist from uh youtube right for the year it's uh i don't know how many songs it is i assume it's at least 50 songs maybe 100 songs oh it's 100 songs um, these are my top songs of the year that we listen to out in the sunroom. So I've often people sometimes on Instagram like, oh, what do you listen to? And it's kind of, it's hard on like a device to be like, oh, we have, I added these five new songs. Um, this is pretty representative. I have to say of the type of music we listen to. So I have made this public on YouTube music. I realize not everyone's there. Um, but if you, I don't know how you would do this. I've never done such a thing before, but it is public. So if you look me up on YouTube music, you will see a 2022 recap playlist, which is six and a half hours long. And you are welcome. I will listen to your playlist, although to enjoy that it is a little odd. Uh, it's a it's an it's interesting a, it's mix. A very, it's eclectic. And yeah, for, I really like the new Def Leppard album. Yeah, when you guys went there, I was like, you know, they have a really there's a lot of good songs yeah. on that album, and yeah. most of it is actually in this playlist because I did listen to it a lot. And you're a trendsetter. That's what it says. Yeah, I think you are. <laughs> I guess I, not that many people have know. Shahad Taylor Swift. I know. And and Def Leppard in the same I know. top ten. That's just wild. I do things like every every night as you're playing, you'll you'll kind of um you'll, something will occur to you. Like that song that my number one song of the year is uh, off that new album and it's it's not a single and it's something Def Leppard does really well. It's the type of and I said, I'm gonna I said I know you my wife's not a huge Def Leppard fan, but I was like, listen, let me just play you three or four of these. I'm gonna go back to the past four albums and pick the song like this. That it, that hits at this exact kind of mid tempo. It was never a single. You would never would have heard it if you're not a fan. But it's awesome music. Like it's a really good song. You're a great band. There you go. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just me, but whenever I see the name Whitey Bulger, I think of you. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> I was born a little too late to help with the okay. concrete work that he was doing. But. Okay. I just, I, I'm looking at the Wall Street Journal and it, he, there's a Whitey Bulger headline. And I thought, really? He was killed f like four oh, years, years ago. ago. Well, I was fascinated that they caught that guy and how yes, they did it. Yes, and a federal report uh, said uh, mm -hmm. now that uh, the, the, the guys were tipped off by somebody on the inside, some prison officials who said, Mr. Bulger might just be getting transferred uh, tomorrow. Oh, so. yikes. And okay. that's, that's how they knew. I uh, feel like guys like him, like Jeffrey Dahmer's like this, they end up in jail and then... They're not really supposed to be out with everybody, and then they are, and they die. Yeah, general pop. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. At least, according to the uh, report from uh, the DOJ, 100 prison employees were aware of Bulger's upcoming transfer. Some of them mm -hmm. spoke about it openly in the presence of inmates, at least one of oh. whom predicted in an email to his mother that the crime boss would be killed. <laughs> wow. uh, but they uh, they got Freddie and Paul and Sean who were indicted. Sure. Yeah, not Freddie, Polly, and Shani. Polly and Shani. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're going up the river. Oh, wait a minute, yeah. they're already up the river. Um, there is a weird code in prison. You know, obviously they go after certain types of criminals, and then there's also this notion of like this guy's famous, so if I kill him, I'll be famous. Right. You know, which is why, at least, always ask me this. I have kind of recurring, you know, thoughts about what if I go, what will I do if I go to prison. Like <laughs> what? How am what? I? What? That's our Leo. reaction. Is do you, why are is... you anticipating anything? I said no, no. But I just want to be prepared. I watch with great avidity the uh, dramas about how they teach soft old people like me how to survive <laughs> in prison. You'll like pump, you'll be pumping iron. I'll you'll be have pumping to iron. You got to pick. Yeah, you got to pick somebody. <laughs> you know, right, right up front, and right. you and you got to just get in a fight, the and kick, the ass, kick their asses. <laughs> then people yep. will be scared of you. Probably the number one tip I'm going to guess is not to wear this sweater. <laughs> Hi guys! Into the prison. Did I? So I was. I was in. I was an MVP. Hello, fellow felons. Go one ahead. thing I got from Microsoft was a a leather jacket that was beautiful, and but it had an IE logo stitched into it, and so I never really wore this jacket. Yeah. And then I don't know what I don't remember the point of this, but I one night I wore it to basketball. Uh, the league I was in at night and I was, I just walked in the door and the guys were, we're all, you know, talking and laughing and this guy is looking at me and I'm like, and he, all of a sudden he goes, is that, is that an IE logo? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, am I going to be beaten up? Oh. <laughs> like what's going on? Add that to the list of things not to wear to your yeah. first day in prison. They're telling mm -hmm. me uh, I should not say, Hey guys, Emacs or Vim. Right. Don't don't try any that. fellow Swifties in here. <laughs> Who likes lisp? Just show of hands. Uh, I'm gonna give you a lisp. <laughs> I'll give you a lisp, buddy. <laughs> Mr. Paul uh, Thorat, Paulie, we call him. Paulie Walnuts uh, is at uh, Thorat.com. T h u double r o double good dot com. Uh, that's where. You, and by the way, become a premium member because that's where his best stuff is. Just really great articles about all sorts of stuff. And you did, uh, you didn't do music yet. I imagine you might eventually. No, I did. I did. Oh, you did? did. Okay. You yep. did do articles also on the podcasts and the books. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I, I'm sorry. I did not write up the music. I'm yeah, not yeah. sure if I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah. But. Uh, well, maybe I will. Maybe I will. Yeah, whatever. It's, uh, it's all there throughout the com. So uh, the field guide to Windows 11, portions of it are there, but the full book you must have is available at leanpub.com. And with your purchase of the field guide to Windows 11, in a mighty generous well, it's a mighty <laughs> generous gesture. He, yeah. is, he is giving you a copy of the Field Guide to Windows 10 as well for the same price, too. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Uh, thank you, Paul Thorat. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Are you going to be uh, in the, in the uh, U.S. of A for the rest of the month? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. Uh, we Paul says he has this sweater too, but he's he refuses to mm -hmm. wear it because he doesn't like. Sweaters. Well, no, I thought I was going to save, save it. it. We're going to save it for the last show of the year. That's good. That's the twenty first. Our best of is the twenty eighth, and we'll be back okay. January fourth. It uh, will probably come off in the first commercial break because I'm going to be getting hot and I'm getting sweaty here. Yeah, just get very about sweaty. It. All right, Paul, have a wonderful week. Drink some eggnog. Yeah. Enjoy music night tonight. Oh.
Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We uh, do Windows Weekly every uh, Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC. You can watch us do it live, live.twit.tv. Join in the repartee at irc.twit.tv or in the Club Twit Discord. Have I mentioned how great Club Twit is? If you're not yet a member, uh, please go on over to twit.tv slash Club Twit. Check out the benefits. Seven bucks a month, that's all. There's a yearly plan, which would be a great gift for the geek in your life. Uh, there's corporate plans, and it supports us doing what we really love to do, what we really want to do, um, and, and bringing you the best tech information. You get extras, all sorts of them including the Discord ad-free versions of all the shows. You get special content we don't put out, like uh, Paul's show, Hands on Windows, uh, which is covering some really interesting topics. If you're a Windows 11 user, there's some stuff you want to know. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. all be there. Uh, you can get that for two ninety nine a month, but honestly, why not spend a couple bucks more and get the whole thing? The whole shebang. Twit.tv slash club twit. Thank you very much in advance. Paul Therat, thank you. We will see you next week. On Windows Weekly. Yes, you will. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. <laughs>